September 17, 2014, to order uh, at 7.09. 7.09. Yes. Uh, I'd like everybody to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Mm -hmm. general public comments. I'd like to say that there probably tonight will be a, well most likely, there will be an amendment, I'm, I'm sorry, a, um, what am I worried I'm trying to think? A motion to uh, table on the uh, wireless um, order tonight. So, um, because we're still working on the details of the of the ordinance, so and the amendments to the ordinance. So with that, uh, general public comments, uh, name and address, three minutes. <clears throat> Martin Tripp, I can't believe uh, what you're talking about at Piper Shores. You're going to go and cover 50,000 square feet of space on the second project with houses. I figure you're going to use another acre and a half parking. So you're going to cover three acres with runoff. And that slope there goes to the back right behind Oceanwood. And if you've ever walked there behind Oceanwood, I don't need this. <laughs> yes, you do. If you've ever walked there behind Oceanwood, it's wet a lot of times. And you're going to cause a runoff to go back there and make three inches of water. I feel sorry for the people at Higgins Beach, at least I'm up on a hill. Most people will be right in it. Then they've got a proposal to put a water pond, a retention pond there. If you go up on Piper Shores and you look at it, there's a series of wetlands and retention ponds. This is going to add another one. Somewhere down there, I'd place a bet, I'd give you odds, that there will be a spring popping up down there someplace. This water got to flow somewhere. It's not going to sit there in one spot. It flows downhill the last I heard. You people got to think of these things. You can't just say, I'm going to plan this, and to say that, well, our zoning density is this or that, or this could be that. Well, listen, Oceanwood was built, the planning specifications at that time, so it was Ocean, uh, Higgins Beach, and if you go down to Higgins, Higgins Creek, excuse me, you go down to Higgins Beach, some houses you can shake hands with your neighbors. So if you think that it makes a difference, shake hands with the neighbors right outside the window. So let's not talk about density and potential and the rest of this stuff. Let's see what it's going to do to my neighborhood. It's 45 houses that's put at risk. Really, there's 29 of us, 11 at Higgins Creek and scattered houses around there that could be damaged by that flow of water that won't go out in the ocean that quick because there's such a thing as salt water intrusion or bedrock. That water can just as easily sit on the surface and make a mess. So before you make plans to do this sort of stuff, I wish the planning board would think about it and not come to me and the town say, oh, we didn't think of that. There you go. Have a good day. Thank you. Next, general public comments, name and address. Three minutes. Uh, Robert Rovner, uh, 4 King Street, Pine Point. Just a couple of things. One of the things that really troubles me about this town is that the communication, everybody claims the other party for a lack of communication. The uh, people of the town blame the council, and the council's wrong because everything wrong with the people last minute. They get no chance of public comment, or enough public comment, and then the council or the town says, well, the people don't pay attention, they're, they're apathetic, they don't care. Well, 
I know you guys have a, have a website. Um, I think a lot of people here are, have a lot of have kids. We have at least 3,600 students in town. Um, a two-parent family, say they're all they're probably working. My dad at 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at night, when the kids are there, they want to go online to see about what the agendas are. So I have two proposals. One is, just like Mark Maroon has an electric sign outside his place, that the town put one out on the corner, rotating, and every day telling town's folks as they drive by when the council meetings are, when the committee meetings are, and what's going on in town, and what, what the planning is. The second thing is that once a quarter, at least once a quarter, that the town council, led by the chairman, whoever that might be, that they put out a newsletter. It'd be mailed, not emailed. You want to set it up on your site and post it, that's fine. But this should be mailed to every resident in town. It should incorporate a letter from the chairman of the, of the committee, of the council, excuse me. Every committee head, every, every person in town who, has, who owns a budget should make a comment. It should be a calendar of the quarter every month, indicating every meeting for that those three months. And that, again, if you're looking for feedback from the community and you want them to be involved, tell them what's going on. This has never been done in this town, and it needs to be done, and the public is deserving of that information. The other two items that I have are regarding the charter. I think the state of Maine requires that the towns meet once every 10 years to have a charter commission. Now, I think that something like that is more than adequate for a sleepy hollow. We're not a sleepy hollow. You can't wake up in the morning and find out what happened that night. That something's always going on in this town. I suggest that you um, consider having a charter meeting once every five years. And I think the first agenda in my mind, would be to establish a new political structure in town and to establish an office of mayor who would coordinate with the town manager and with the town council, and that would allow the public greater access. <coughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you. Next. Pamela Rosner for King Street. I want to address a few things regarding the plovers and the beach monitoring this summer. I'm going to use Audubon's language from last year. And I want to address the vehicular homicide that happened on Old Orchard's Beach this summer. A plover chick was murdered by a policeman driving an ATV. I don't understand how this homicide did not gain the same attention as the murdered plover chick on Pine Point Beach last year, as Audubon proclaimed it to be. After all, murder is murder, regardless of where it happens or who committed it. I also don't understand why our town council and town manager are not calling the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. The five-year contract that our town manager negotiated with them, which will wind up costing Scarborough taxpayers upwards of $178,000, should be null and void at this point. The basis of this should be discrimination. U.S. Fish and Wildlife is holding Scarborough to a different standard than a neighboring town. That's discrimination. Our town attorney should be on top of this, and they should be asking that the $500 fine that was paid be returned. These are the feds we are talking about. The federal law, as we were told over and over, applies to all towns not just Scarborough, and it seems that Scarborough is being discriminated against. Or is the deafening silence from our town further evidence that our new animal control ordinance was never about the plovers to begin with? The other thing I want to mention about the plovers is that when a family of plovers wandered into a motel parking lot, who was called? The owner of a hunting dog. According to Audubon, the most deadly predator to the plovers was dispatched to herd them successfully back on the beach, and Bell did it beautifully. Regarding the beach monitors, 
We were fortunate on Pine Point Beach. For the most part, the monitors were nice. However, that was not the case on Higgins Beach. As a matter of fact, the police were called because of a monitor on Higgins Beach. In another incident, a rumor was started on Higgins Beach, and then it was repeated several times over, defaming a resident's personal integrity. There were monitors on Higgins Beach who were trying their best, just hoping to catch a dog owner. They wanted more than anything to catch someone in violation. These are just three of the many incidents that occurred on Higgins Beach. I don't call this type of behavior a success. A more appropriate phrase would be that it was an extremely hostile, hostile environment, and it needs to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Laura Hannon from 17 Powderhorn Drive. And I just wanted to ask, first of all, I have comments about the cell tower issue. Is this the appropriate time to make them, or will there be another time that's better, or will you be asking for comments before yes. you will table? Well, yes, when the order comes up, the public can address us. So that would be this evening? Yes. Or later on? Yes. Okay, I'll come back then. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Mo Erickson and I live at 288 Pine Point Road. I feel like every time I come up here I'm always complaining, which is probably true, but I want to preface this just saying I, I don't envy your jobs and I appreciate all of the time and effort that you put into them. But with that said, um, I went to a meeting last week uh, concerning the Dunstan Village proposal and at that meeting there were quite a few consultants there. Um, all putting their hand in the pie and trying to tell us how to spend our money. Um, and I, I couldn't help but feel like it was a bunch of professional people who don't know anything about the people in the town or the way we live or the things that we stand for telling us what we need in Scarborough. And I'm really tired of that. I feel like... Um, there are certain people in the town that are running it, and we just get to stand by and watch. And only at the very end do we find out about decisions that are being about to be passed. So I really wish that we could, as Mr. Rovner said, somehow maybe we could hire a consultant so that we could spread the word and educate mere commoners as myself about the, the goings on of the town and all the different ideas. I don't know, I, I don't think I spoke to one person who knew anything about the National Guard Armory topic that's going to be coming up. Nobody knows about that. The whole uh, land swap down at the Lighthouse Motel, nobody really knew about that until it was almost too late and uh, I just feel like maybe we need to start thinking about having old fashioned town meetings where people actually can vote and, and say what they need to say. Um, I, I feel like nobody's being heard and that town, town members that run the town have their own agenda and I'm just, I wish it would change. With that said, I wish that people, I wish that we could stop paving over every spot of green in this town. It seems like it, if it, there's a green lot, well, we've got to put a bank on it or we have to put something. And surely, with this talk of the Dunstan Village, I, I can't see how the National Guard Armory down in that section of Scarborough can mesh with the potential of a village. So um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Adjustments to the agenda. I mean, I'm sorry. Minutes. Bless you. No problem. <laughs> Second. Anyone? Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Adjustments to the agenda? None of the time. Items be signed. Treasurer wants. I'll sign them as the meeting goes on. 
Order Number 1482 is a 7 p.m. public hearing of the Scarborough Town Council and the Planning Board for preliminary review of a contract zone application submitted by the University of New England and the Maine National Guard with action by the Town Council uh, later on. I would also like to acknowledge that members of the Planning Board are present for the record. We have Susan Oglis, Alan Paul, John DuPont, Corey Fellows, Ron Mazur, Nicholas McGee, Dan Bacon, <coughs> the Planner, and Jay Chase, Senior Planner. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll have uh, Dan introduce us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just quickly going to touch on process again. Uh, like the, the last matter that was before you during workshop, this is a proposal for a new contract zone. Um, and the process is a little bit different than amendments to a contract zone. And Jay put together a memo dated September 8th that kind of outlines um, this process. And uh, this evening, the intent of the first meeting to, is to have a joint meeting uh, with both the council and planning board to receive a presentation by the applicant. Um, staff will have a few comments on the application to allow for a public hearing uh, at this first meeting and then have discussion about the application and then actually provide direction to the applicant as to the council's feeling on the proposal and that helps them decide whether to move forward with the contract zone uh, proposal or, or not. Um, following this first joint workshop and public hearing, um, rather than an amendment that goes to the town council for the first step, uh, like was discussed at Piper Shores. Um, the, the first or second step after this meeting is planning board uh, review. The planning board reviews the, the site plan in this instance and provides a preliminary approval and then it would come back to the town council for consideration um, for the contract zone through your first reading, public hearing, second reading. So it's a little bit different process uh, than a contract zone amendment. Um, given that probably most of the council hasn't considered a contract zone, at least in the last couple of years, um, like discussed with Piper Shores. It's really a process reserved for kind of unique projects that don't neatly fit in the zoning ordinance or in a specific zoning district. Um, and there's um, some key criteria that uh, contract zones need to meet, uh, including a a public benefit. There needs to be a, a, a specific and unique kind of bu public benefit or mm -hmm. uh, public interest component to, to a contract zone uh, proposal. So uh, with that introduction, I'll I think turn to the applicant for their presentation. I guess the first step. and I am the Assistant Vice President of Planning at the University of New England. Uh, with me tonight is uh, John Blaze, senior, senior Planner with uh, the Maine Army National Guard, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dion with the Maine National Guard, and then Colonel Drummond uh, with the Maine National Guard as well, and Tom Saucier with Site Design Consultants who helped us put, the, put together this application. Uh, first, I thought I'd explain why the University of New England is here working with the Maine National Guard on this project to help put it into context. The University of New England has campus in Biddeford. We have one in Portland, and most recently we've opened one in Tangier, Morocco. Our Portland campus wraps around the Stevens Avenue National Guard site. For many years, uh, we've worked with the National Guard on uh, joint uh, relationships. We have um, leased space from them in their building. We have current leases for parking in that area. And we've been expressed a concern over the years that uh, if they had an opportunity where they thought they might vacate those premises, we were very interested in those. The Stevens Avenue site's been there for about 73 years. The building has seen essential maintenance only. It's, uh, it's worn. It's, it's um, due for replacement. The site is not currently in compliance with Department of Defense standards for new construction, probably about a quarter of the size that the Department of Defense would recommend today for the activities that are ongoing there. The National Guard has received funding to 
work at this, to do work in southern Maine for this facility. It doesn't make sense to dump good money after bad at that site when they're never going to have a facility that meets current standards of the Department of Defense. So the university is working with them to find a location that would accommodate their program and then in turn the university would purchase that site and then do a land swap for the land in Portland for the site that the National Guard would then build their new facilities on. So in that case they would get a brand new facility that's consistent with Department of Defense standards and the university would in turn acquire the land on the Portland campus that's, a part that's adjacent to our land. So that is the reason that the university is here working with the National Guard. Uh, part of our due diligence uh, in order to have this transaction is to assure the National Guard that we would be able to um, provide for those facilities on the piece of land that was selected. If you look at the screen, we are looking at a site in Scarborough. It's highlighted the proposed contract zone. It is um, just off of Route 1 is here. This line here is the Saco city line. Scarborough, Saco. Route 1 is here. Parcel is outlined in red. The site we are looking at is this site here, labeled Parcel B, in conjunction with this site here in yellow, Parcel A, which happens to be in Saco. The current zoning in Saco allows for the readiness center to be built there. The zoning in Scarborough currently does not. Uh, when the zoning was made, um, there was no readiness center or National Guard facilities. Didn't really get consideration at the time. It's fairly unique. We're looking to say that it could be consistent with the zoning that's in place in Scarborough, and we will walk through that um, with you tonight. I thought it would be helpful at this point to turn the podium over to Lieutenant Colonel Dion so he can explain <coughs> what the National Guard's program is for the site, how the site would be used, how it would be operated during the day, during the week, what might be on the site, what it might look like. We have some representatives of some uh, sample projects that they're currently working on, and I would like him to explain it to you so that you can get a good understanding of what it is from their perspective that we're trying to um, see if we can get zoned for this parcel of land. Lieutenant Colonel Dean. Good evening, Will Dion from the Maine Army National Guard. Um, just, just for clarification, that uh, the majority of, of our work obviously is one week in a month. I think most people understand that. But this particular site will have 24 full-time employees that work there day in and day out. On average, uh, I guess if, you were gonna, if we were going to put it into uh, general public terms, probably about 19 blue-collar and about five white-collar jobs. Um, on average, between the blue-collar and white-collar, we're talking anywhere from $48,000 to $50,000 a year um, annual salary. Obviously, uh, newer folks make a lot less than people who have been around for a while. Um, so on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, you're going to have 24 people coming and going from that building from the military department. Uh, at other locations across the state, we have multiple people using our buildings. Uh, we have there's a DOD pre-approved list that it's an automatic uh, okay to do. Uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, most of the nonprofit organizations uh, can use, you know, government facilities uh, free of charge. Uh, it's also we also have different uh, organizations that come in and use our buildings. Uh, fire, fire department in Portland uses the Stevens Avenue Armory. Um, we have some municipalities that come in and use it, as, especially when they're doing renovations uh, on their buildings. But overall, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that we're here in case of national emergencies. So as things, if, if things go bad, weather-wise or whatever, in the city of Scarborough, obviously our building is what we want to be the beacon for EMAs to come to. Um, we can, you know, it's going to have an open floor space for, for drilling soldiers, so you could put a lot of displaced citizens in that in those buildings uh, if need be. The uh, on average, I would say that uh, we're looking at probably a little over 100 additional people coming in on that one week in a month, two weeks a year to that facility. So when you look at overall uh, traffic, it's 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 really a, a blip on the screen for the city of Scarborough. Um, and 
part of what we, we need, those new standards, again, it's probably no surprise to everybody that the world changed 13 years ago. And the Department of Defense wants to have standoff distances between its facilities and potential vehicles that could harm those facilities. So we, we try to make as much, we're required to make as much buffer as we can between us and if we need to be close down our, our driveway, if you will, to stop vehicles from coming in and, and uh, harming us and our buildings. So the intent is for us to kind of be a, a beacon on one hand for, for a community as well as not be seen by the community. <laughs> um, it's, it's a tough, tough situation to be in, but the, we do not want to be up against anybody that can build near us. Obviously, Poland, that doesn't exist. Um, we have the opportunity here, and part of that is uh, one of the things we want to do with this parcel is we've got inland fisheries towards the, towards the eastern part of that parcel. We want to take some of that back parcel, put it into a conservation easement to make sure that nobody ever, whether you know somebody that replaces me or whatever, decides, oh, let's, let's divvy up this parcel and do, we put a conservation easement on it where we guarantee ourselves that, that buffer from, from neighbors. Um, the project that we're looking at doing here is, is, is two different phases to the project. Uh, the first phase is about a $17.5 million, what, what you would know as an armory we call readiness centers now. Those buildings that, you, that you've probably seen around the state um, from the overall, it was like a blanket uh, construction project back in the 40s, and all buildings look the same. We don't do that anymore. We, we build our buildings to try to be modern. <laughs> yeah, so, so this, is, this is a rendition of what we're building in Brunswick right now. So it's, it's, a, it's a highly, highly energy efficient uh, lead silver building that, that uh, you know, we have, we have uh, core of engineer standards that we have to build to, to, uh, to show that we're self-sufficient. And of course, all, our, all of our facilities uh, need to have emergency backup power already on, which is why we're a beacon for EMAs. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of parts of the other states, some of the more depressed counties uh, actually use our, use our facilities for that. That's, that's their plan, and their contingency plan is to use us. Um, the second part is, is the best way to put it, we call it a field maintenance shop. It's, it's for all intents and purposes, it's a wheeled garage. So anything that you would think of as a garage for maintenance. Um, and those, those people will, that, that project itself would be an, uh, an additional $15 million of construction into, the, into this area. Um, so as, as far as the, uh, I'm trying to think what else, as far as could you, what we talk about, anything? Are there any questions of, you know, what we exist for and what we offer? <laughs> okay. Um, what do you want me to wait for that? We have to do you know, right? Okay. Um, I guess what we'll do then, um, is, is that the end of the presentation? Is nope. any Okay. Oh, just, we'll do the questions after. We'll have to do, we'll do the presentation, um, we'll have public comment, and then we'll um, do an order to... Uh, move to council and uh, planning board mm -hmm. questions. So continue. With Thank it. you. As right. Lieutenant Colonel Dion pointed out, the, up on the screen is the Brunswick Readiness Center. Here's a look from the, the back side. You can see up on the roof you got some photovoltaic panels. It is a LEED certified building. Uh, these are actual construction photos. These were taken in September. Um, excuse me. So it's not your typical armory vision. This is one of their exterior storage facilities. This is the Bangor Aviation Readiness Center, a rendering that is under construction as well. You can see it looks a lot nicer than the old uh, buildings that they used to bring forward. Going through this process, we met with the uh, town staff and were advised of the procedures when we discussed the zoning. They gave us the requirements for consideration of a contract zoning and we have gone forward with that and we've provided uh, an application. Uh, the first part of that application was to define the area that we were looking for and again it's the area in red. It's approximately 24.6 acres. It's uh, currently RF zone 
this darker green area is a resource protection zone and it hits the parcel in a couple areas and you get a TVC town village center uh, up along Route 1. Part of the project, what, uh, part of the application was to go through a site analysis to look at the different criteria required so that you would be able to make an informed decision on this. Uh, up on the screen is a uh, combined plan that shows both parcels, the Saco parcel as well as the Scarborough parcel, so you can put it into context. It has the resource protection zone identified here, and it actually comes onto the property here, but when we did our field investigation, it appears that that line may actually move off of the property, and we need to confirm that and work with the planning office to make sure that uh, our analysis is correct. There is a stream that bisects the property here that comes down through and then connects to Stewart Brook. Then you have Cascade Brook and ultimately it goes out to the Scarborough Marsh. Mm -hmm. The area at this um, back section of the property is also in resource protection and this is the area that we are considering putting into a conservation easement. It abuts the land holdings of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and then there are some other Scarborough land holdings down there so this would augment the buffer to the Scarborough Marsh and add some value to the uh, local resources. Uh, the slope is generally from Route 1 here. It slopes down to the back of the property. So all of the water essentially runs across the site and connects into this drainage channel and or back down to this drainage channel. Uh, you can see some of the contour lines along this stream are fairly significant. Um, it would be difficult to work in this area. Most of the proposed development would be up on the upper section closer to Route 1 than on the back of the parcel, and you'll see that in the concept development plan. There is an area here that's identified as a, as a candidate deer yard area. And what that is, it's not necessarily an active deer yard that's been documented by Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, but it's a possibility that the area could be used by one. So we've picked up that on the mapping and have noted that there. And then there is some um, upland um, wading bird habitat up in this area here that just brushes the edge of the site and then comes down through the back section as well. So that's provi uh, provided in... Section C, is a, it's a Exhibit C. Um, the vegetative cover, the upper section of the parcel is essentially an undeveloped field. Um, you can see uh, in this aerial photograph, the site in question is this area here. And I've, number, I've put a red dot, and that's where I took some pictures of the site so you can appreciate um, the, what it really looks like. The first one is up towards Route 1, and this is standing right on the property line, right on the intersection of um, the line that bisects the parcel we're developing. It's on the town line, so you're looking essentially down the town line uh, in this perspective. So this is looking towards Route 1, standing on the edge of the property. This would be looking up Route 1, towards Scarborough. There's one residential house in that area. And you can see the property line is essentially right here in the, in the photo. So the property to be developed would be to the right. And then this is looking back across the property, back down towards the woods, across the field. And then this is looking back towards Saco. Uh, the curves, if you're familiar with that, is located out behind these trees, Eastview Parkway. <coughs> When we did a site uh, visit, we, uh, we've walked the site extensively, and there is no um, cultural features to speak of out there. It's essentially an undeveloped parcel. There is no uh, scenic or rural roads, no hiking trails to speak of, no snowmobile trails, stone walls, historic tr structures, or anything of that nature. There's some evidence of uh, logging in the past, and that's about it on the site. Part of the community relationship, uh, we talked about uh, the conservation easement on the back section of the property. The access to the property, going back to the site plan for a moment. The access to the property would be from Route 1 
on the Saco side down Eastview Parkway into the Saco portion of the site to get to the Scarborough site, so all of the traffic would come in from <coughs> that area. All the utilities would follow that same path down Eastview Parkway and come into the site. There is on the uh, current deed for that parcel on the Scarborough side, there is a deeded right-of-way that goes with that, that goes out to Route 1 as a 50-foot right-of-way. That would go away with the purchase of this property, so that parcel on Route 1 would not have that deeded right-of-way in it, which makes it a much more developable, developable parcel from uh, the town's perspective. You wouldn't have half of the site eaten up with a right-of-way that couldn't be developed. The next section was the uh, plans uh, that needed to be submitted, and we do have the existing condition plan um, in conjunction with um, a composite plan that talks about the regulatory issues related to that. There would be some uh, DP approval, obviously, that would have to happen if this site was developed. Uh, we would have to take uh, concern with the uh, resource protection areas. We would have to work around any of the uh, habitat issues in the wetlands areas. Um, there are no freshwater wetlands on the site. I failed to, to mention that. There is some, uh, the stream that you'd have to have a setback on. So the uses that were discussed are the readiness center and the uh, field maintenance shop. This is a conceptual layout of the site, and then this is fairly early in the, in the process. What we were really striving to do with this drawing is to document that the program for the National Guard could fit on this site. So we did the rough outlines of the building footprints. Here is the readiness center in this location that represents that. That would probably be a um, two-story, potentially three-story, but most likely a two-story building with a large drill hall, there would be instructional spaces, there would be office spaces, there would be storage available in that building, uh, about 50,000 square foot overall of usable space on two stories. The field maintenance shop is actually illustrated in this location and that would be in the 29,000 square foot range. And then there are some parking and roadway uh, external storage of, um, for equipment that would be on the site as well. So we've been able to demonstrate that working within the constraints of the site with the stream and the resource protection zone, this field area with a little bit of the treed area could accommodate the, the, the whole uh, program that the National Guard would like to put on there. We've talked about relocating some of these pieces around and maybe pulling the readiness center down towards the access drive and then moving the parking lot over into this area which would provide a little bit better buffer zone between the residential house, the house here and the rest of this property. These lots here on the front are the TVC um, lots. They are outside of the rural farm zone that this parcel is in. So this area here is um, the village center district, I believe it is, TVC 3, town village center. So these have a different zoning um, in the zoning on this parcel, and obviously the Saco zoning is, is somewhat different as well. The construction of this project would take into account uh, energy efficiency. So you could see the examples that were brought forward. They use photovoltaic, they use daylighting, uh, they designed to be energy efficient so that they are uh, not costly to operate and have less impact on the environment. Essentially, the um, function, as was indicated, would be most of the time, Monday through Friday, normal daytime hours. The weekends would be used once a month for uh, training, so there wouldn't be a lot of activity during peak traffic times. They would be primarily on the weekends when you may have up to 100 people coming to the site, so that would offset any traffic impacts that would happen during the work weeks. The other piece that we were asked to look at is um, how this proposal or this application, this use in the contract zone area would be consistent with the Scarborough Comprehensive Plan. 
And in our review, we found that, uh, in our opinion, it was consistent in many different ways. Um, the proposed uses include non-municipal government uses, um, the training, mechanical, surface equipment repair and maintenance. That surface equipment uh, maintenance and repair is like a public works facility to, uh, to, to give you a, a visual perspective. High bay garages where they would work on trucks and trailers and all the, the other equipment that they would have to support the unit. Uh, the actual readiness center kind of works like a, a town hall to a certain degree where you've got offices, you've got people coming and going, uh, relatively small staff, not high traffic volumes. So we feel that that is um, consistent with the comprehensive zone as municipal uses are allowed in this district. So we think that this is consistent with the intent of that, even though the readiness center is not necessarily identified as an accepted use. We think that it's consistent with the intent of allowing the municipal facilities. The, the uh, vehicle maintenance area is um, essentially a, a light industrial use, and we feel that's consistent with the comprehensive uh, plan in that it recognizes the current lack of area zone for light industrial uses in the town. And we think that this future use, this uh, future potential use actually speaks to that, where it's a, a light use, it's not an um, intensive use, but uh, something that could be supported in this area as well. <coughs> we believe that the proposed uses of the National Guard are consistent with the economic goals uh, presented in the comprehensive plan. The uses will require the employment of skilled technicians and office staff that have high paying jobs, which we believe is consistent with, a, with objective B4, Scarborough will grow and attract businesses that offer high quality, well paying jobs. And that, um, that's spoken to in several places in the comprehensive plan. We also believe that it is in, um, in compliance with the comprehensive plan and that the conservation values that the plan seeks to promote this would help foster those uh, in many different ways. It would, by having the conservation easement, we would add to the buffer of the uh, water um, going into the Scarborough Marsh. It enhances the overall wildlife habitat in the area. It promotes additional recreational activities by expanding that area. Um, so it's consistent with Objective C1 of Chapter 5, Objective C.3, C.4, C.5, and we also believe that it's uh, in, com in compliance with Chapter 5, Section E, the Historic, Recreational, and Cultural Resources, specifically Objective E.3, which is to continue to support the Scarborough Land Trust and acquisition of easements and purchase of rural land for open space recreation. We think that this easement that we've been talking about would also speak to that as well. The building is designed to have a useful life exceeding of 50 years. Um, it is going to be uh, designed to be energy efficient. And then again, we believe that yields, so we feel that that's in compliance with the comprehensive plan, chapter five, section F, land use objective F.6 reduce the impact of development on the environment through the use of green building technology. So we, again, feel that that's consistent with that. These, uh, as uh, Lieutenant Dion indicated, that this facility would allow for an evacuation, to be used as an, act, an evacuation center. We feel that that's compliant with the comprehensive plan, Section K, Fiscal Resources, Objective K.4, in that, it explores alternative methods to finance operations and fund facilities and infrastructure needs that more closely correlate increased capacity needs caused by growth or that relates cost to service required by location or type of facilities. In other words, it's a facility that the town can use for evacuation and emergency purposes that the town doesn't have to invest any dollars in. So we feel that this building could serve that purpose in the, in the times of crisis. <coughs> We also feel that this uh, location of this contract zone being right on the town line with Scarborough, um, the Scarborough zoning allows for a much more intense use of development. It allows for uh, 
uh, eating and drinking establishments, it allows for office buildings, it allows for uh, indoor recreational facilities, public spaces, um, many, many different things that could have high, high use. We think this low density of development use in that it, we would use about 5% of the overall site for building would be a low density transition from a more intense use on the Scarborough side it gives you a much wider buffer before you get into the town village and or the residential rural farming district. So by having that buffer, it kind of eases that transition instead of having a more intense use sitting right up against the rural farm district. Uh, we think this transition is, is consistent with the comprehensive zone that um, section, or actually ob objective B.2, action B.2.B, point B, which dictates that there should be substantial buffers where there is a transition from non-residential to residential uses. We believe this is consistent with the comprehensive zone in that perspective as well. So moving through the application, we've been, we were uh, required to demonstrate that the proposed contract zoning amendment is consistent with the existing and permitted uses within the existing zoning district classification of the property. Um, again, the low density of the proposed use, we believe, is consistent with the low density residential development in that area um, so that it's consistent with the existing zoning. It's similar to um, the permitted uses in that it's a uh, typical of municipal building. Municipal buildings are allowed in that district. Public works features, we feel that it's consistent with that existing zoning. There's not a, a large stretch to, to go to a readiness center. Um, we believe that the density is um, density of the buildings, the structures, the level of employee staffing, and the traffic that would come to this facility with occasional spikes is consistent with the other uses of that site, which could be agricultural or agricultural um, stores where you may have a farmer's market where on the weekends you may have an influx of traffic, uh, but normally during the, the week it's, it's a lesser or moderate level of traffic. So again, the, it's consistent with that vision that was in place for the existing uses as well. And again, uh, we think it's uh, consistent with the, uh, the transition of the zoning from the SACO into the transition uh, into the uh, RF zoning district. Um, we believe that that is also consistent with the, exist the, the intent of the existing zoning. We were also asked to look at the proposed contract zoning amendment is in public interest. So we feel that it is and that it permits a military maintenance and training center that benefits public defense. I think we would all agree that that is a benefit to the community. It allows construction and operation of the readiness center that could be available for the public in emergency use for evacuation center. It allows the, a readiness center facility that can be available for municipal, school, nonprofit, civic organizations to use, and um, that happens a lot on the Stevens Avenue site. The yeah, Portland Fire Department's in there training on a regular basis, and that would be available in this area as well. Uh, it enhances the protection of the natural resources by placing approximately three and a half to five acres of land bordering the Scarborough Marsh estuary system into a conservation easement, so that's to the public good. Uh, we believe that it enhances the uh, economic benefits. One, you've got the direct construction costs that would go out uh, to the local economy, as well as the everyday operational expenses. The Armory has, uh, or the uh, National Guard, I should say, generate more than $195 million in, in the economy in the state of Maine uh, through construction and their daily operations. We feel that um, you know, the contractors coming to work on the job using the resources, the, the guardsmen coming in on the weekend using the local resources, as well as the jobs of the full-time employees would have a, a positive uh, benefit to the economic uh, state of Scarborough. And then we're also asked that the proposed contract zoning amendments will have beneficial effects on the town as a whole, which would not result if the property were developed under the existing zoning district classifications. So, again, it, it sounds like I'm, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but uh, to answer that question, um, 
we feel that uh, the light industrial use, again, being compliant with the comprehensive zone, allowing those to happen in this area, um, would not happen if the zoning stayed as it was. The high skill, high wage jobs that would be created there, uh, if it remained in the rural farm uh, district, it's a limited opportunity. It's not a great site for farming. It slopes. Um, it's, it's narrow. I, I think that the, the skilled wage jobs that will be created um, would not otherwise be created in this area. Um, for an institutional use, state military and emergency preparedness will be conducted where an emergency evacuation center would be available. That's a benefit. Where governmental nonprofit groups could have meeting, again, a benefit to the community. Additional protection of the Scarborough Marsh. And then the buffer in the zoning. So, you know, we really feel that the intensive use in the, in the Saco side transitioning to a rural farm, and, and it, you, know, you can't even throw a stone and you'd already be there. This buffer zone of, of light density use makes for a nice smoother transition as you go from town to town. <coughs> Up on the screen, I have uh, a drawing, and I've highlighted the areas that are currently held uh, in ownership by the state of Maine with an M and or the town of Scarborough with an S. I've outlined the property here, and you can see the conservation easement that's being proposed. And you've got the Cascade Brook coming down, uh, Stewart Brook coming down. And the marsh is fairly well protected. Um, state and the town should, should be congratulated on the, on the work that's been done to protect that uh, nice resource. One of the weak links is in this location. It's one of the narrowest buffer strips that exists in that, that area, and we really feel that you know, augmenting that with another conservation easement really would help, that, uh, help manage the uh, quality of the marsh from a natural resource uh, area. This slide here kind of shows the entire parcel outlined in green. You can see the town line kind of running right through here. As you're driving north on Route 1, the access is here. You're still in Scarborough. You come down. You get to this point. Well, actually, you get to this point here. That's the Welcome to Scarborough sign. So you're well past the site by the time you even perceive you're in Scarborough. Coming south. The sign, the town line is here, again, well before you get to the access point. Again, giving you the perception that you're in Saco when you're looking at this site. So having that transition of the zoning here that's um, consistent, I think, would allow the lower density uses on this site while still allowing development of both parcels in a way that respects the community and the transition from Saco and Scarborough a little bit better than might be with other potential uses. And again, this just highlights um, access into the site would be here. This roadway here would be uh, developed and connected back down to Don Marie Drive so that there would be uh, two um, roads coming into that site. And the right of way that I spoke of is, is located here. And you can see that. This is the residential property, and this is the other site that could be developed. With that right-of-way there, it would make it difficult to develop that site. So by taking that off of the table when we purchase parcel B, uh, that allows that site to be developed in, as part of the town village um, district. Again, highlighting the town village uh, center district here, the zoning there does allow for non-municipal government use, which we believe this is. Um, it allows for municipal use. It allows for buildings that are 45 foot high. Uh, the rural farm zone, uh, you can see here, I actually put the Scarborough rural farm zoning uh, dimensional standards here. The Saco contract zone dimensional standards are below it for comparison. And then off to the right, I put the <coughs> proposed Scarborough contract zone uh, changes and I highlighted those in red just so you could see um, that there's not a lot, a lot of significant difference between the RF zone that it currently is and what's being proposed in the contract zone. So if we look at the 
uh, Scarborough RF zone, lots 80,000 square feet, frontage 200 feet, front yard 50, setbacks of 15 feet or 50% of the building height, uh, building height of 35 feet, building coverage 25%. So essentially we're changing the frontage in the front yard because there would be none on that parcel. And then um, lot size stays the same, setback is essentially the same, and then the building height uh, we're suggesting goes to 45 feet, which is consistent with the TVC district here and consistent with the SACO district here. So the SACO zone, you can see uh, they've got the frontage of 200 feet, um, setbacks, uh, front yard 75, setback 20, height 45, and the maximum lot coverage of 40%. So it could actually have a much denser development on this parcel of land abutting this, this area here. So we feel that proposed um, conceptual plan with the building lot coverage of, uh, building coverage of 5% is going to be a lot less of a development potential than if it gets developed under the current SACO zoning. Oh, I think that is the majority of what I needed to cover tonight. I think you'll find that we have answered all of the re, um, request for information that was in the application. Uh, we would be happy to answer any additional questions or to expand on any of the things that we have talked about tonight. So um, with that, that, that ends our presentation, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to have to have that taken down right for public comment. Sure, you can comment now? Yeah. All right, we're going to start off with uh, public comment, uh, name, and address. Three minutes. My name is Maura Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. And uh, contrary to what he said, that land is being used now. Um, my husband, a lifelong resident of Scarborough, hunts there with my boys, and they fish there down in that stream. And they hunt turkey and they hunt deer down there. So it is being used. Um, I know that he mentioned something about a potential deer yard. Well, my husband's going to kill me if I say it out loud, but yeah, it is a deer yard. And um, as soon as you start building, though, it won't be. Because like anything, once you start building in a, in a place where animals go, whether it's deer or birds or turtles, they move. And um, so you'll be sure to drive all that habitat away. Um, I know that you talk about the conservation easement and stuff, but I can tell you, blah, blah, you'll just be back when you want to build more to get a, a, a new change of ordinance or a new usage or something. You say you're going to save a little spot of land for public usage and keep it all pristine, but we all know that that changes. We see it all the time here. You come up and you ask for a, some type of um, extenuating circumstance. It's a national security issue and now we've got to build over the whole thing. Or, or I, I don't know. But I, I know that that can have that that does happen. Uh, you talk about the um, potential for a evacuation place. Well, gosh, I hope that the forty million dollar school that we just built will hold some of us, then we can evacuate there. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe Scarborough High School and Wentworth and the middle school. Um, I don't I don't think we need to build an armory to evacuate there. Um, the other thing is, um, he mentions, uh, I, I guess I, I, I just feel like surely between the Walmart area and the Mussey Road and the Haggis Parkway, surely we must, and Scarborough Downs, we must have another plot of land where we could build something like this. And why do we have to have it in Scarborough? Why does Scarborough have to have every single thing? Uh, I don't feel like we need to. And uh, my last comment, thank God the marsh is protected. Because if it wasn't, 
I'm sure somebody would find a way to pave over it. And I'm just glad that I live about it so that when I look out, I can see it and not see a parking lot or a cell tower or a Wendy's or a lobster facility. So I'm just thankful that the marsh is protected. And I just, I, I hope that we don't end up having this pass. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, good evening. My name is John Fair with us, 752 U.S. Route 1. Uh, probably the only neighbor that these gentlemen are going to have. Um, uh, to you gentlemen, thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Um, I was notified three days ago about this. So I'm not really prepared to talk about what I need to talk about, and I'm not here to agree to disagree. Um, we bought the house in 02, my wife and I and our daughter. Um, it is nice looking outside at night and seeing 10 to 18 deer running through the fields. It is nice to see the fishermen coming up from that brook every single morning when I go to work at 5. Um, it was nice to see Cleve, the owner of the property, clear the lot because he was talking, this was a month ago, to talk about the house he was going to put in with a nice gravel road out back and wouldn't impact anybody. I guess he had a different agenda, huh? You know, my daughter's in eighth grade, and we look to sell the house soon, you know, maybe four or five years. What's my property value going to do with a building surrounded by barbed wire? I just don't understand. And how, what, is, what the buffer are you talking about? How does this benefit me as one neighbor, one voice? Thank God, too. <clears throat> With all due respect, I agree. Haggis Parkway would be the place to go. Why come to Scarborough? Why go to the only spot? Why pick my house behind my house, the only house in Scarborough? It's the only house in Scarborough. I, I, I get it. I get it. There's a need for you here. But why there? What's it going to do to my property when you move in? Are you going to buy it from me for double the value or, or value plus? I'm not a negative person. I don't complain. My wife hates it about me. But <clears throat> this isn't good for us. It's not good for me. Like I say, I'm only one voice. But I hope you guys listen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? My name's Don Hamill, 3 Bay Street. And, you know, I think the main point I want to bring up is by the way that you are presenting this to us now, it's clear that this has been worked on for months. For months. It's quite clear that you're really only allowing the opportunity f for people to deal with mitigation issues. By the way you've positioned this and many other issues, like this recently in town, you, you really eliminate almost entirely the opportunity for citizens to have a voice in the town government. And people are tired of it. Tired of it. We're up to here with it. And this is cloaked in, you know, in the garb of a national security issue Homeland Security, readiness centers, armories, and so forth. But we're really not happy about this. There's no chance for any question and answer. This is merely a chance for comment. You really don't listen to what people are saying, and you don't really give them an opportunity to choose other options or to participate in that. And this has happened repeatedly over the past several years. And this is something that the town management and the entire town council needs to start taking responsibility for. And this, for the first time tonight, I've heard people talk about other forms of government, and I think that the time for that is coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, no applause. Anyone else? <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, with that, I'll close the public hearing. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. It's up. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Okay. That's public hearing, Richard. Is there a motion on them? Folks, it doesn't say in action. Am I reading that wrong? Write this wrong. Discussion on the application. Okay. Yeah, I think it's sure. best if you um, solicit discussion among the members of the planning board and members of council, and then uh, perhaps a motion is in order at that okay. point. Okay. <coughs> All right, discussion. Who'd like to be first? Anyone? <laughs> Just to be clear, but just to respond to uh, the, the last uh, speaker, uh, personally, um, I was made aware of this perhaps 10 days ago, no more than two weeks ago, and for reasons that I'm not aware of, this was fast-tracked very quickly to get before you. Uh, this comes to you without staff recommendation. It comes as an application. They're entitled to make that application. So for those that think that this has been known and worked on clandestinely for months, that is simply not true. Uh, this has been... Uh, come to us very, very quickly, and they have every right to make this application and request to the town, and that's that's what's happening tonight. And this also has got a nine-step process that goes along with it, the planning board. And I think it was an eight-step, and we added the joint planning board and council um, meeting. So, Richard, I'll go. Yes. As a member of the planning board, I'd like to also refer to what the last speaker just said. I got a notice that this was going to have we were going to have this workshop. I didn't have a clue what it was all about. I couldn't figure out what has UNE got to do with the Army. It wasn't until somebody I haven't seen in a long time came in and I discovered, well, it's because we're going to do this flop. Well, it makes sense to me. I mean, that that's what makes a lot of sense to me, that that works for everybody. But we have not heard a thing about it. So you don't don't go around out there thinking that we know something you don't know. What you've heard tonight is all I know. Now the good news is it's not the last time that we're going to get together to talk about this because right. Richard, how many steps? Nine. Nine steps that we're going to go through. Okay, and this is just their opportunity to tell us what they want to do. That's literally all it is. And at the end, the. The, the council will make some kind of a suggestion as to what the applicant might look forward to. We like it, we don't like it, we don't know, we want this, we want that, whatever. Okay? So I don't have enough to have an opinion about this at all. None. Hmm. But after this stage, it's going to come to the planning board, and therefore we're going to learn a lot more of the details, I hope. And we have a public hearing. Do we have a public hearing at that point? Yes. That, that's, that's correct. This is why we have this forum, Planning Board Council. The applicant has come before us um, to, uh, to pitch their idea, um, and it's nothing we're going to be voting on tonight. Uh, the public's going to have plenty of time to give input on, on the subject, and uh, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Um, we go through this process all the time for years and years and years. This is the way it's been done. If there's changes that need to be done in the future, we'll look into doing that. But this is the way we it's always been done. So with that... I would like to then make a comment about the application. If you may. <laughs> Um, I don't have. A I, I agree with most everything that was stated in terms of the fact that it probably does come sort of under um, benefit to the town. Okay. I'm very concerned about wildlife. I'm very concerned about um, the places where the stream. What is it? The um, um, why, why do I not? The resource protection district how that's going to be and where it's going to be and what are we going to use for buffering and is it going to be barbed wire, you know? I mean, I have all those kinds of questions. But the basic idea of that land being used for this does not bother me. But I have a lot of questions about how it's going to actually, you know, look and the, de it's mm -hmm. the devil's in the details. Okay. Uh, Ron. Yeah, I just want to reinforce what Susan just said. Uh, as far as when uh, this information came to us, and again, I, it's a nine or eight or nine step process. Uh, it's a learning experience for me tonight to hear what the applicant wants to do. Uh, I've made a lot of notes. I have a lot of questions. Um, 
some of which Susan just mentioned, others about noise buffering, architecture. I mean, it's a long way. Uh, and uh, the insinuation that this was done behind closed doors and is a completed job, uh, in my own way, I resent it because uh, we work very hard on the board to give every person who lives in Scarborough an opportunity to present their point of view on every application, and we listen very, very intently uh, to everything that we hear, and uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's a far uh, uh, it's far from a, a foregone conclusion as to what's going to happen. And again, I'm not in any position uh, pro or con tonight. Um, I agree with Susan that in the, in the big umbrella, it, it probably is going to be or will be uh, beneficial uh, to the town of Scarborough. One of the questions I have, though, is we mentioned Scarborough, Scarborough, Scarborough. Where does Saco stand in all of this? Have they taken this into consideration at all? Has it been presented to them? Uh, and uh, how does their contract uh, phase with our own? Uh, I have no idea where they stand in this whole situation, and I think that's an important ingredient for us to hear uh, also at some time. Uh, and like I said, without going into any further detail, because I will get into that when it comes before us as a planning board, um, um, uh, you know, I welcome the fact that we have this joint session uh, to learn the initial idea, uh, what the intent is, uh, and give us food for digest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Anyone else? Alan? Sure. I'll, I'll weigh in as the planning board is weighing in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think this project is going to propose some unique challenges for the planning board. Um, as I'm sure it will to the town council. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we're in a situation where we're physically going to be, from what I've seen so far, we're physically going to have a building that's going to be built partly in Scarborough. It's going to be built partly in uh, Saco. We have different design standards. We have different um, uh, kind of processes that we follow. And uh, certainly it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the process is going to work whether we get together as boards, we don't get together as boards to try to do something uh, jointly. So I, th I think just that in itself is going to propose some unique challenges for planning staff um, and for the for the planning board. So, and again, I'm, I'm sure the same will be uh, in effect for the council. Um, some of the the thoughts, obviously, that I have initially certainly talk about site plan evaluation, site plan process, and storage, and outside storage, and what will we see, what will we not see, buffering, um, as we've talked in the past, I think all of those things are going to play a very big factor. I know that there's some talk about, you know, call it eight to five um, uh, during Monday through Friday, but are we talking about 24-7? on the weekends or certain weekends, and I think as we deal with that and as we uh, think in terms of noise for abutters, um, it's easy to throw up a tree and kind of break a view. It's a different thing <laughs> to deal with noise, noise abatement, and if we've got 100 soldiers uh, going ooh-ah in a room, it might radiate. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm just saying things that we need to be considering in terms of what neighbors and, and uh, abutters are going to be dealing with. So very interesting challenges here. Um, as Ms. Oglis said, she's not opposed to it at this point, nor am I in terms of I think it's, it may be a good spot, actually, in the town um, in terms of some, some of our zoning and what we're trying to do. But we have a lot of things to work through before uh, this is cooked. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excuse me. No, you can ask a question at another time. This we're having a council meeting and planning board meeting. Um, so, what I'd like to do is whoever's going to speak to this is, as the questions come, uh, to be you know prepared to make some you know answers and suggestions. 
at the podium. Um, well, let's see. Um, we'll get this. I'm sure there's going to be some other questions. And um, w one of my concerns is the uh, the abutter that uh, spoke tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's a that's a big part. That's a definite possibility that his uh, the value of his property may be affected. So I was uh, I'd be curious to wonder what you would offer um, to uh, make things right with that property owner that if the value of his property was decreased by this. And one of the things that Alan mentioned was a buffer, um, you know, and uh, noise abatement. That's another big thing. I'd like, you know, um, there's a lot of things that need to be worked through. Um, but I'll, I'll um, let others speak. Anyone down here? Um, Councilor Holbrook? Sure. sure. Um, I have a laundry list, so I'm just going to kind of meander my way through them. They're not necessarily questions as much as they are things to keep in your head, thoughts, you know, things to have ready and prepped as you come back through this process, um, and one or two questions. But uh, my first note was, um, and even before the gentleman spoke, about his ownership outreach. Mm -hmm. I want to hear, I want to see, I want to talk. I want to know that you spoke to every person that's around you and everybody's happy with it. There isn't a project that I've dealt with at this point since, you know, my tenure here, um, you know, whether that was our Broad Turn Habitat for Humanity project or, you know, when we did, you know, some other things, it's outreach. So you, you need the support of your neighbors behind you or maybe not their love and undying gratification, but certainly they're not disgruntled <laughs> um, and they're not in a position to be in a home that's devalued. Um, that that has to be a right that's made. So um, abutters and outreach and owners and, and reach out. Um, my questions kind of revolve a lot around what you've already touched on, um, Paul, uh, has to do with what, what does SACO want and, and how does that in line with some of our rules? And, and, you know, there may be issues where their building code is different than our code and, and how does that line up? And um, I, I don't know if we can legally allow certain things without, um, you know, mm -hmm. not following our own rules. So, you know, again, some, some joint conversations <laughs> there. Um, it sounds to me, and, and I guess the, the, the thing I never heard, and I, I'm going to assume, which can be dangerous, um, I'm going to assume that we're talking about the 133rd. You, you were speaking to bays, you were speaking to trucks, you were speaking to those sorts of things. Um, it just so happens I have a teeny tiny bit of knowledge of Stevens Ave, and um, my father was 133rd. So some of the activities that go with that are intriguing. So again, um, concerns about noises. Um, like I said, I didn't really necessarily hear who was utilizing this, this possible new station, but uh, the activities that 133rd might do and what a different branch of National Guard, because of some of the talks we've heard up in higher powers, might not be the same. And so how if this changes and you are no longer 133rd and there's a different unit in there, how does that change the activity and the use of this location? Um, and again, I want to go back to noise. Heavy equipment brings heavy noises as well as some of your machinery to work on those larger vehicles and larger trucks. So again, noise should be considered within the building footprint as far as how to absorb some of those sounds. Um, there's certainly building materials and those sorts of things that can help mediate noise, or remediate, sorry. Um, I do applaud you that you have a green building. That's fantastic. Um, I also have another question, and, and just a, not necessarily a question, but a thought. Again, if you're talking 133rd and maintenance of vehicles and those sorts of things, you have things like oil and mm -hmm. contaminants that are going to be um, in this building and, you know, possibly, again, I'm not sure what type of equipment you're talking about, but, um, you know, that needs to be kept in mind of how those things are going to be handled uh, where you do have a watershed on, on that property. Um, so again, you know, how, how are you going to collect those things as oil drips or hydraulic, you, you know, whatever. So um, what will be your plan to make sure we're capturing all of that? Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say my last, my last piece here. Um, 
it was not that long ago that um, the state of Maine was here in front of this council talking about what a wonderful concept it would be to have a turnpike exit almost directly across from you. And I remember thinking at the time, there is absolutely no benefit. You can pitch that until the cows come home. There's, there's no benefit. We've sunk all our energy and funding and planning and time and energy and effort into HIGAS. So that's where our infrastructure is. That's where all of our planning and money, and there wasn't a huge benefit. Certainly there's a much bigger benefit for a National Guard base to have an exit across the street from the highways than there is really for Scarborough. Um, at the time it was pitched to us that we had a 20% share for this endeavor. Um, I, I would like to see, no offense, show me the money. So, you know, give me something. Where's the benefit for Scarborough? Well, the benefit is we have a base. It's green. It's clean. We're conservating property out back, which I think would be a much, if this was built out at a household threshold, there would be a lot less woods out back. So I think you serve many purposes, but if we had that additional, you're going to help us pay for that turnpike exit, I think I like it a little more. So, um, you know, I wish you luck, and I, again, would love to thank you for your service as well. And um, <coughs> my personal two cents is I hope the federal government doesn't do something stupid and leaves our 133rd alone. Councilor Donovan. Uh, Councilor Holbrook has uh, very well, uh, better than I could, express my outlook on this. I would add lighting as a critical uh -huh. element <coughs> to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. I was impressed by this gentleman and what he said, and I expect that you were also, because uh, you're reasonable people and you want to do a good project, uh, we all know that. And I think that probably the next thing you'll be doing is being in touch with your neighbors, prospective neighbors, so that uh, uh, and when you go to the planning board as the next step, uh, if that is the next step, uh, you'll be able to uh, assure them as they surely will be asking that you've begun the process of trying to make it right and that you'll be a good introduction to this neighborhood. <clears throat> Anyone else? Councilor Katerina. Uh, just to my quick two cents, ditto and ditto. <laughs> um, and again, uh, I thank you for your service on uh, the National Guard. I think a lot of people don't understand uh, the time commitment, particularly in these past few years, having to go overseas and whatever, uh, which was never the original intent of the National Guard, but I'm not going down that road right now. Um, my concern as uh, the liaison of the Conservation Commission is the conservation. I was very happy to see um, you're looking at doing a conservation easement. Um, when I was looking at your preliminary plans, I had concerns also because I know there's going to be heavy trucks, whatever, whatever in there, and it, as Jessica pointed out, it is a watershed. So we've got to make sure that we plan correctly for that, pay attention to impervious service surfaces, um, which, you know, runoff and whatnot. Uh, and again, uh, I think this should be looked at at whatever point it makes sense by the Conservation Commission in town. And that's it for me. Hey, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I will uh, echo what Councillor uh, Katarina said about the um, about the the uh, the need to get the Conservation Commission uh, get there, get them to weigh in on this. Um, I do appreciate as well the the proposed conservation easement, um, but I do question, and I'm uh, frankly a little bit skeptical about the real, whether uh, this project as currently envisioned would really uh, be a net positive in terms of protecting that watershed in that area. Um, I realize that the site plan that's in here is just preliminary and very, conce very conceptual and the pieces can all still be moved around, but there are constraints there. Um, and it looks like it would be sort of a challenge to keep maintenance sheds, things like maintenance sheds with heavy equipment and parking lots from being fairly close to some of those streams. Um, uh, as a couple of my fellow uh, planning board members have said, there are certainly some sort of site plan considerations that we would need to grapple with uh, to the extent that this goes forward, uh, including where certain elements would actually be sited. Um, I'll let the 
to the applicant um, respond definitively, but I believe in, in, in possible answer to the question about where SACO stands on this, if I interpreted it correctly, um, their zoning allows this, if not as of right, then at least not, it, it's, it's much more permissive than ours. So uh, that still leaves some questions about the actual site plan review. Um, but my understanding is that on the, on the Scarborough side, the burden is, uh, the burden is much uh, higher. Um, and, and then in terms of looking at the big picture a little bit, you know, Appendix B of the, uh, the uh, comprehensive plan, Vision for Scarborough says in part, fields and farms south of Dunstan will be preserved as a gateway from Saco. Um, and I guess that's open to some interpretation as to what protect means. But I think right now as someone who comes up that way from the south quite a bit, um, we were talking about this during our Dunstan workshop the other night and someone else made the, the comment that, you know, I, I sort of look forward to, the, to that ribbon of, of green that's there as you're entering Scarborough. And I think it's very important that we, as a town, do protect that. Um, and I, I do understand that there's some potential benefits here. Um, and then in terms of, you know, whether this is really the ideal site, on the planning board we frequently hear people say things like, well, you know, we have public comment periods and so forth. Some people will sometimes say, well, why couldn't you do this somewhere else in town? Why couldn't you do this at Highgate? Why couldn't you do this on Payne Road? And I generally, um, yeah, I generally like to try to avoid that type of thinking because we, uh, we review and consider the projects that come in front of us as they come in front of us. And as someone who's involved in development myself, I know that there are a lot of things that come into play and the transaction that you're able to put together is the one that you have. Mm -hmm. That said, um, because this is a little bit more of a different, different venue and a different forum and more of a preliminary kind of conceptual stage of things, I will say, and maybe just putting on my, taking off my planning board hat and putting on my citizen hat, that was one of the first things I thought when I read this. Um, with the hundreds of acres of planned uh, uh, infrastructure filled land that we have around Haggis, um, why couldn't something like this go there? I know it's sort of a rhetorical question, um, but it also occurred to me as I was listening to the presentation and there was a comment about uh, having an evacuation facility uh, that to the extent that that would be a town benefit, I would like to see it someplace closer to the center of town, someplace that's close to the highway right next to an exit where we have a lot of available land. So again, I know that a lot goes into these putting these transactions together, uh, but those are just my two cents on that, and uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to look at this at this stage. Um, my look at this is, uh, Corey, is that this is uh, the area and the property that the applicant is applied to build this, and this is wh what we have to look at. So it, to me, you know, why couldn't it go here or there? We have to deal with what's before us right now. So, um, but with that being said, um, whenever we uh, have changed the zone or um, done anything, uh, we've done public outreach. We've had meetings at fire stations to get the public's input. L uh, letters have gone out. Um, it's been in the papers. Um, a lot of the things that this council has done has been in the papers for months, months and months and months, in ordinance meeting after ordinance meeting after ordinance meeting. So to say that the council isn't transparent or this government in Scarborough isn't transparent is not true. And I've done a lot to try to make it more transparent, like this meeting tonight. And there'll be more of them in the future. So um, there's going to be another one in the next council meeting, another workshop that the public can watch and see what uh, councilors uh, are are thinking. So um, that being said, anyone else? Yeah, I just have one question. Yes. Um, the piece of property in, in Saco, who owns that property? Yeah, um, what we'll do is um, 
Oh, I'll have you, you know, um, we've got all, a lot of questions for you to answer, so go, go ahead and take the podium, answer that one, and then we'll go back over some of the uh, other questions that have been asked. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. uh, specific answer is that's currently owned by uh, Park Development, I believe. Is that the Park North, Park, North Park North Development is the current owner, and the University of New England has a purchase and sale agreement on that parcel at this point. So we have interest in it. Okay. Um, does anybody here have a question? Okay. Are you prepared to answer some of the questions that are asked? Tonight? Certainly. Uh, okay, thank you. The timing of this, and I appreciate the ability to get on the agenda as quick as we did. We, the University of New England had an opportunity on this piece of land. We found out about it, and we sat down and looked at the opportunities, looked at the zoning, met with the town staff. They were alerted just a couple of weeks ago that we were interested in this. They told us what the process was. And we worked long, hard hours to be able to pull this together in the short time frame. If we had a month and a half to do it, your notice might not have been all that much different because you would have got the normal public notice. I don't know that there would have been a notice of a notice going out. So we worked really hard to get that brought forward, and, and we appreciate the fact that we were found to have a complete application and that we were able to bring this forward to you tonight. So um, for lack of a, a, a better notice, we, we you know appreciate your concern. Uh, we know from our experience that having uh, community outreach and workshops is critical to the su success of a project, and you know we, we expect that we will go forward with that process and follow the rules and regulations that you put forward to make sure that this is done, open and above board, and, and according to your regulations. Um, the SACO parcel is currently zoned in a way that allows for these uses. We've met with the staff down in SACO. They agree, they've looked at the proposed use, they've looked at their zoning ordinance, and they've told us that they felt that we needed to do was to go straight to site plan review. And so we've talked about those different uh, uses, and they said it's consistent in zoning, put together a zoning application, for a, a site plan application, bring that forward to us, we will review that as would the, the Scarborough um, Planning Board. The original design that we put up had the building co-located uh, between right, with the property line running through it. We've had discussions with the National Guard and, the, and have uh, <coughs> discussed relocating the pieces, as I had indicated. And part of that is directly in response to the questions that you have. Who would regulate the design of those facilities if they're straddling town lines? Mm -hmm. We think if we move them around, put one or both of them in one area in the, in the supporting infrastructure in the other area, it could be a lot cleaner and easier for the planning boards to look at that to see if it's consistent with the zoning or, uh, with the zoning criteria and the dimensional standards that are that are in place. So we will we will make this as easy and clean as we can, and, and we certainly should be able to move things around in a way that can um, keep it clean from that perspective, so that you're not looking at dual standards for the design of a facility. So we will we will take a look at that. Uh, the conservation easement that was uh, brought up, that would be a deeded easement. That would go with the parcel regardless of who would the actual owner was. That would be a recorded deed. And so that would be set up in a way that was a legal document. It would be recorded in the registry of deeds, and it would be on that piece of property going forward. So we would be willing to work with the town of Scarborough, work with the, the state. They actually have ownership on a couple of the parcels. This is the state we're dealing with. So we would work with those two entities to construct a conservation easement that protected the resource in perpetuity. So they, they wouldn't be able to go back and say, oh yeah, we were you know, thinking we might want to do something else in that area. That won't happen if it's recorded on a deed. So you, know, you can take that, um, take that to the bank, I guess. Uh, we, we understand that the um, neighbor has concerns. Uh, you know, this is a big project in their backyard, literally. Mm -hmm. The original conceptual plan had a buffer around it. We know that we're going to have to do something to mitigate any of those potential impacts or perceived impacts that might happen. Uh, we've moved rather quickly in the last two weeks to get where we are today. We have not had an opportunity to have any community outreach 
and we knew that by bringing this forward, that was going to start tonight. <coughs> that we had the opportunity to bring to you our concept mm -hmm. and to try to get some idea: is this something that can real realistically go forward, or is this something that you know everybody's dead set against and this won't work? And we need to have some direction. Mm -hmm so that we can start to refine the plans, understand what it is we may have to do to mitigate any concerns that people have, so that we can bring that forward in a way that's constructive and hopefully positive for everybody, and that we can at least have discussions and hopefully we can come to some mm -hmm. uh, common ground and find some win-wins for everybody. I don't think you're going to be able to solve every problem, but I think if you listen and, and open your mind up to people's concerns, you can find ways of solving some of these issues in the design process that work for everybody. And if that's as simple as moving the readiness center closer to the access road and creating a less active area with a solid buffer that would pre prevent noise, some noise transmission and light transmission, uh, you know, maybe that's easy to accommodate. So we will certainly look at that. Uh, the Armory has done a nice job uh, in Portland with managing their environmental issues. Uh, they have in place spill control containment pads for the, some of the vehicles in the, in the storage areas. Uh, I've seen their protocols. We've actually done an environmental assessment on that site because we're doing our due diligence. If we become the owner of that, we don't want to buy a hazardous waste site. It's not. And they've been there a long, long time. We've gone through and done a phase one and a phase two on that site, and they've done a, a really nice job at keeping that site clean. We're willing to buy that or do the land swap. So we wouldn't invest our money and effort into buying something that was a hazardous site. So I can, I can speak to that on, on their behalf, that they've done a really nice job managing um, the issues uh, responsive to stormwater, spill control, and containment on that property. Um, I think I answered most yep. of the, the questions. Right. I may have missed one or two. I'd be yep. happy to right. if you want to. Yeah, can New, Eng New England um, University yes. is purchasing the property in lieu of the property in Portland? Correct. That's okay. That was one of the questions. Yeah, and then we would do a land swap for those two pieces. Right. And um, just uh, just a comment. Um, thank God we're not dealing with a neighborhood. Um, you're dealing with uh, one individual, and I'd like to, you know, you think about it because that, you know, that that is his property. And if we move forward on this, and um, you know, um, it, it could lower the value of it. So going forward, I'd just like you guys to think about that and and reach out to this gentleman as we if if we're going to continue to move forward. Um, was there any more questions? I want money. Did I, did I mention that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Could we now take one more okay. I'll on something? Yep. I'll fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I believe uh, John Blaze, uh, Maine Army National Guard. Th there was one other question. You know, we, we talked a little bit about impervious area in the watershed, mm -hmm. protecting the watershed. Um, a lot of our designs have been LE, you know, LE designed. So, um, and one of the you know ways that we get the points to meet the the, the you know criteria is doing low impact uh, development techniques. So essentially, I don't know if you know what that is, but mm -hmm. that's you know treating mm -hmm. the stormwater at the location that it's created. Mm -hmm. So you would have little pockets mm -hmm. of treatment around rather than having a big pond downstream somewhere like that. So you know, in terms of dealing the uh, on the quality side of the stormwater, that that'd be a way we would deal with it. Mm -hmm. Great. Richard. Yes. Could you one more question. Uh, would the National Guard be paying the town of Scarborough property taxes? No, they legally can't. Okay. Uh, can you pay a, a fee in lieu of taxes? We can pay an impact fee for the construction. So if we needed, a, say, a six-inch water main for fire protection, mm -hmm. and you have a four-inch main on the, we could pay an impact fee to get <sighs> the line upgraded. Thank you. To, to answer the councilwoman's question regarding the unit, Right now, the plan is for the 262 engineers. The 133rd engineers 
as force structure is right now, is nothing more than a battalion headquarters. It has no subordinate companies other than these. The Army went modular years ago. So it is a horizontal engineer company, but it technically isn't the 133rd anymore. Um, and all our maintenance facilities, you know, all our facilities have oil water separators. Not only do we have to meet DEP standards, but we have to meet uh, <coughs> the Army Corps of Engineers standards. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Brunswick, you know, the state of Maine requires a 250-foot buffer on a vernal pool. Corps of Engineers requires 750 feet. So we have to meet both the state and the federal standards. So, uh, you know, it's a two-headed monster, but it's something that we have to do in order to get our construction done. Um, was there any mil other military specific? I, I did. Yeah. Um, my, my question had to do with, um, and thank you for the correction, if you're, if the base itself went from more of a engineering type activity to, say, a different unit, which is I've, I've heard about in the news, um, a, a more of a, like a military police unit has been kicked around. Um, not that I agree with that concept at all, but <coughs> if, if that were to happen, what type of activity would happen on this base now? Regardless, at the armory itself, nothing will change regardless of the type of unit. It's a place to assemble, okay. and then they go off to, we, have, we also have large acreage across the state for training areas. Mm -hmm. The closest one to here is Hollis, we have in Brunswick. So to do what we consider military training, mm -hmm. not classroom, I mean, don't get me wrong, we do classroom training, but to go out and physically do our mission, our, our special mission, in this case for pushing dirt, we go up to Hollis or we go to Brunswick. We won't do that on site. It's just an assembly hall uh, place for the unit to, to gather uh, more than anything. Um, as far as uh, Constantino wire, that, I, mm -hmm. I don't think we have a single facility now with Constantino wire. We do have anti-crawl wire on fencing so that over where we park our military vehicles, believe it or not, you know, in order to protect the taxpayer's equipment, because it's, it's, we're just signed for it, we have to make sure people don't come in and pilfer or, or vandalize our equipment. So around where we park our vehicles, yes, there will be, there will be fencing with anti-crawl wire over the top. Um, as far as lighting goes, all lighting starts from the outside going in, mm -hmm. and uh, our current designs are it's motion detected. So it won't be on at night unless somebody breaks the perimeter near the vehicles. Yep. Could could you provide uh, the planning board or the town council with uh, the fees that were paid to other municipalities for which projects have been developed in the last couple of years? I can I can tell you we're doing a water main right now in Calus. Impact fee to run s almost 800 feet of six inch line was like 190 grand. And there were several other projects that were referenced, Brunswick and there was no fees associated with that. Uh, Brunswick is a little bit of, a, uh, of an anomaly because the Department of the Navy gave up the property and then they needed property back for the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah. And so they paid all the utilities coming into that post. So I can't really speak of, we just basically had to plug and play right next door to them. And the, the, when, I, when I talk about buffer, we're talking about distance. And, and being able to, anything that can stop vehicular traffic. So. Um, a lot of times what we use now, we, we try to use natural barriers, so what you'll see is huge boulders that are, mm -hmm. that are taken out from the site and placed on the perimeter just wide enough so that a, a car couldn't drive through across a field if it was needed from that. On the back side where it's pretty steep and goes into a stream, we won't have any buffers because the well, cars are coming from that direction anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I just jump in at the moment, Richard? Yes, yeah, um, so, yeah. Okay. I would just like to say that I don't have any problems with how this is going to get done. The, the planning board will make very sure that everything is safe and that all the oil and all the lighting and all the buffering, I mean, that's what we're here for, and we do a pretty good job of it. I'm not concerned about that. I mean, I'm just concerned about if this is the place for it, and that isn't a decision that we make. That's a decision that you people make. So just so we haven't got to go through any more of the specifics of how is that going to happen, believe me, it'll happen. <laughs> okay, yes, I swear it's the last one. <laughs> I have one, suspe one specific that I know, maybe yes, maybe that's you, I don't know who it is. Um, 
that I know isn't going to happen at the planning board level. Um, I happen to be working on an ad hoc committee at the moment that has to do with historic preservation. Mm -hmm. And and the thought that came to me is that Uh certainly your building at Stevens Ave is, you know, a 73-year-old building, and and that's fairly significant. I mean, it might not be ancient, but it's significant. Um, My father would say that's not very old. Well, yes. (laughs) Well, yes. Thank you. But I I do recall that there... um, (laughs) I have not been there in a very long time, but um, I do recall that it did have some kind of unique architecture and, and some structure, well, you know, uniqueness to it. If there is something that you could bring from that that had, you know, maybe it's a statue, maybe it's a something, but if there's something you could bring from that to your new site, um, if this is so the will of the council, um, I think that would be nice. It, it's not something that is required at the moment in any way, shape, or form. I know it's not maybe specific to Scarborough's um, history, but it's certainly unique and specific to, to, to your history. Um, I think it would be right. a nice thing. Right now, the uh, the granite that you that you see is on a on the Shippo, the State Historic Preservation Officer's list of eligible things. The only thing in that building is the granite cross rifles representing the 103rd Infantry from. World, uh, World War II, right? From the Civil War. <laughs> um, that is that is historically significant. Whether or not we could pull them out of those buildings and put them in the new building. Oh, but you're engineering. You, you're smart folks. You can <laughs> find a way. I'm not, uh, but I don't even know if the shippo would allow it. To be honest with you, we don't. It's, it's interesting. We will ask. Um, but I can also tell you that this project is a federally funded project, and the federal government can't spend money off its own property. So I can't, when you talked about the, the off-ramp, the state turnpike thing, the federal government would say, I don't care about the, the state of Maine turnpike, and rightfully so, because that's not their lane. So I, just before anybody, you know, might misperceive where, you know, what we can contribute to that, there's no legal way. Um, but I, we can ask the ship all regarding the, the rifles. Why not? It's a great idea. I wish we thought of it. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, anyone else? Council Benedict. I just have one quick question. I'm surprised it hasn't come up before. Is there any intention of having anything to do with a rifle range or anything with ammunition? No, in fact, uh, I mean, one of the citizens' concerns is uh, is the hunting on that property. That would come to a halt. To be honest with you, we we just there's no hunting allowed on on our property. That's that's a uh, that's a commissioner call. Um, to, for us to use a rifle range, uh, we need we we as we actually look at this stuff, we need about five thousand acres. So because it has to be absolutely impossible for a stray bullet on any kind of ricochet to ever go off our property and touch somebody. So yeah. this is not it. <laughs> 6,000 acres if you have it. Yeah, it's a 6,000 <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Rifles would be in a ball and no ammunition. Okay. Yes, oh, well, go ahead. Sure. I really can't get listening to this. See what my folks have been doing. Uh, my name is Dwayne Drummond. I'm the director of facilities for the, for the Maine National Guard and uh, a former 133rd Battalion commander. So I, I can assure you any concerns with the legacy of, of the, the battalion will, will be considered. Um, we, we have uh, been, we have a great deal of experience in doing projects. And I also have been a member of the planning board in, in my hometown in China. So I, I know the kind of work that you folks do. And um, and I know that you you do due diligence and that uh, you don't left any leave any stone unturned and, and that's your job and that that's what the town expects you to do. Um, we are a a professional organization. We have uh, in our office we have professional engineers. We have professional environmentalists and and in fact I, I kind of want to toot our horn is that. In 2013, the Maine Army National Guard Facilities Program was recognized as the best 
in the entire country. So that's 54 states and territories. The same year, our environmental program was identified as the best in the country for small states. So we, um, we take a lot of pride in not only what we do, but how we do it. And these folks, John and, and Will, are responsible for the, the planning of the facilities. We have a whole separate group of people that are responsible for the construction of facilities. We currently have two under construction now, a Joint Force Headquarters in Augusta that will start in another year. Um, we've been very fortunate getting military construction money out of the government when there isn't much to be had. And uh, so we're very uh, sensitive to how we spend it. And we're also very sensitive to when we leave that, um, when we finish that and we cut the ribbon, we want it to be something that not only we are proud of, but the community is proud of. Because frankly, we're all taxpayers. We're spending your money and my money to do what we want everybody to, to really be able to appreciate. So we understand we can't always please everybody, and I'm sure every other project is, is, has the same you know, problem. I mean, we, if, if there was the ideal place to, to put anything where everybody is happy, we would be certainly happy to do that, but I've yet to find a site where that happens. So I just wanted to, to let you know that we, um, we do have a great team and uh, they've done great things. And certainly, if anybody you know wants to visit any of other other uh, facilities, you know, you let us know, and we'd be happy to take you through them. So, you have some idea what the National Guard's building out there. Um, and we'll be having a ribbon cutting in Bangor and Brunswick in the next probably four to six months. Both of those facilities will be done. So, we we really um, are, are enthusiastic about doing something in this part of the state. It's been a long time since we have. And um, you know the, the the reality is that the, the Portland area is just difficult to find sites that are large enough to incorporate all the, the programs that we have. So I, I thank you for all your time tonight. Okay, with that, um, mine just went flurry. Great machine. Um, could you read the order? Okay. We need to move to uh, approve either to withdraw the request for contract zoning or to continue the process to process the request for a contract zoning with or without modification suggested by the council or to revise and resubmit the application for a contract zone under section 2-4-A-I uh, submitted by the University of New England and the Maine National Guard. Pick one of the three. <laughs> Okay, I've entertain a motion on one of the three. <laughs> oh my God. If it helps, uh, the, 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 the next sentence in the contract zone provision says, the vote of town council shall constitute direction from the council to the applicant as to how to proceed, but it's not binding on either the applicant or the town. It initiates the next step of the process. If that gives members of council any comfort in how you wish to propose a motion. Okay, we'll propose a motion, we'll vote on it. Anyone? <laughs> Please. Uh, oh, well, I, I'm speechless. <laughs> well, that's rare. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> uh, Councilor Donovan. I'll take a crack at it. Uh, uh, move to continue the process, the request for contract zoning. Uh, uh, submitted by the University of New England and the Maine National Guard. Uh. With, it would be with modifications? With or without modifications. With or without modifications suggested by the council. Okay. I second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Oh, wait a second. Is there a I don't, discussion? I guess I'm a little unclear okay. what the modifications would be. Um, I know we had a lot of discussion, but I don't know that there was necessarily any modifications. So, um, they don't have to be modifications. So what what degree is the next step? If if I give my vote to support to, to you know, continue along this process of discussion, um, what's the next go around for this? It goes to the planning board for full site plan review. Yeah, it, it goes as Tom indicated, it goes to the planning board for Site plan review. All the details and the And the get. planning board needs to get through site plan review to a preliminary approval step. 
the planning board, if they issue preliminary approval, it comes back to the council and you have a first reading where there can be public comment, <coughs> you have a public hearing for public comment, and then you have a second reading. So okay. the council has that, those orders to add conditions. You can modify their proposed contract zone language to add additional modifications, <laughs> requirements based on how the review process is going. So right, the there's, there's going to be eight more steps. So the oh, inclusion more. of the language with or without uh, modification suggested by the council would uh, cover uh, things we've indicated for direction tonight that we think were important? Or are we talking about things that might come up in the future? I think both. I, both, think, yeah. it, I think it covers uh, all of the, the journey that you're Good. potentially embarking on. That's things clear. that come to light as part of the planning board's process or through your ongoing right. public process. Again, this is intentionally cumbersome. There's about uh, many more steps than the typical zoning change uh, would have. That's clear. Mike, so <laughs> well, we're going to get recommendations from the, uh, from the planning board. Uh, other counselors may have recommendations to add to it, staff. Um, so it's, we're just in the beginning phase, you know. We're two weeks into this. So... Um, you have Council Holbrook? Oh, um, I haven't heard enough from me. Um, no, I, I just, I was waiting to vote, but <laughs> I will guess maybe that I'll just offer that I um, certainly support taking a first step to, you know, explore the discussions and see where it comes and, you know, um, so I'll, I'll plan on voting yes tonight just to, like I said, kind of start the process and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Councilor Caterina? I agree. Okay. Council Blaze, Benedict, anything? We'll shut the more on it. Okay. We're all done discussing. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. With that, uh, I think if the uh, plan board one to cut out. <laughs> I know you guys aren't used to staying up this late. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> oh, that's not yeah. scary. We're, we're going to take a brief moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I couldn't find my... Uh, okay. on the right. Oh, yeah. I went quickly to find it. I was trying to scroll through and Okay, I guess we'll start back in again. That has to be drafted by next week. Order number 14-83 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal request for junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A of the Maine Revised Statute, Chapter 183. We have Gold, Gold, Steel, Gold Steel Incorporated located at 36 Running Hill Road, A. Gagnon or E. Perry Iron and Metal located at Ridgeway Road, Cargo Auto Parts located at 40 Holmes Road and Speedway Auto located at 343 Payne Road. So moved. Okay. Second. Public? Oh, yep. sorry. <laughs> Anyone from the public like to speak on per junkyard permits? Anyone? No? Okay. I close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Now so moved. Thank you. Second. Second. <laughs> Discussion. Have there been any problems with any of these? Okay, thank you. All okay. That's it. Everything. Letter. There's a letter. I mean, there's more history than I, but uh, the recent inspection uh, suggested they were all in compliance. Okay. <coughs> Being all. 
<laughs> take a vote on it. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Vote. Under old business is order number 1453, which is the second reading on the proposed changes to the chapter 405, the town of Scarborough zoning ordinance to create a transmission tower overlay district <coughs> and to update the performance standards there too. This item was tabled from the August 20th, 2014 town council meeting. Okay, would anybody from the public like to speak to this? Uh, three minutes, name and address. to the clerk, please. Uh, Julie Tupper, 165 Spurwink Road. Everybody must be exhausted, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I have to say that um, I'm quite upset at this time, at the time and the taxpayer dollars that this issue is taking. As far as I can see, this issue should never even have been put on the table. And here is why. Let's look at this whole cell tower slash coverage as a typical utility. Let's consider town water coming in off the street, or even electrical for that matter. Both have an end point where that utility is no longer responsible for fixes, usage, maintenance, etc. From that end point, the homeowner is responsible. Let's say an owner has low water pressure, but people down the street are not experiencing the same issue. It's the homeowner who is responsible to fix the problem if it is declared by the utility that the cause is not from the street side. The owner would pay a plumber or any variety of costs to remedy the problem. The town would not get involved and hold meetings about the need to raise the water pressure throughout the town. Same situation with electrical. The owner pays for anything that needs to happen above and beyond the provided services. Now let's talk about cell towers. The wireless output does not stop at the street. It penetrates structures and living cells. Yet the town is involved in trying to remedy something that quite honestly should be remedied by the homeowner. There are relatively few people who might be experiencing spotty service. Let's not lose focus on the easy fixes that are available to those homeowners who are the ones needing to take responsibility for their quality of service beyond what is adequately provided thus far. Uh -huh. As an example, Samsung has a network extender for $250 that is advertised on the Verizon website. The description says, and I quote, does your outdoor cellular coverage leave you hanging indoors? Verizon Wireless helps you enhance your wireless phone coverage so that you can easily make calls and use data from areas in your home where outdoor signal strengths don't, uh, don't reach. With Verizon Wireless signal boosters, you get power to, of a miniature cell phone tower right in your home, minus the huge metal structures. Now, if the town of Scarborough sees it's their responsibility to fix a small number of signal issues, perhaps Verizon would be willing to give a reduced bulk rate to Scarborough so they can provide um, the fix to those who have having problems. Now let's talk about the ordinance change considerations. Last we met, there was a figure of, of 25 plus acres perhaps being the threshold of where a cell tower could be planted. Across the street from me is a farm and they own more than 25 acres. As well, within a mile on Pleasant Hill Road, there is another block of more than 25 acres. So what I'm hearing is, let's keep cell towers out of dense neighborhoods, but those who opted for a more rural setting, you suddenly don't care about. If this goes through, I and other citizens want to hear from the town how much our taxes will be going down along with our property values. So here are a few questions that you need to answer. Is the town of Scarborough suddenly in the business of providing utility services beyond the street? How are you going to manage the potential hornet's nest of issues that will crop up, be it health, property value slash taxes, and sight lines? What percentage will a town use for lowering property taxes for homes within three miles of a cell tower? And why are you not letting homeowners solve their own signal issues that can be very easily addressed? Just ask Verizon how. I say no to additional cell towers. 
I say no to changes in the ordinance, leave towers in industrial zones, do not allow stealth installations, especially in churches, as those are typically in dense neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Tina Chrissy, One Meadowood Drive in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. I live in a quiet cul-de-sac that's currently surrounded by beauty and open space. And the idea that this could change breaks my heart. But it could change if your proposed plan for cell tower placement becomes a reality. Because I am in an RF area surrounded by the 25 acre parcels that you propose to use for cell tower placement. The more I learn about what's being proposed, the more concerned and discouraged I become. Concerned because the thing I love most about my home is the peace and beauty of the land surrounding me. I now feel that I'm being penalized for being surrounded by 25 acre parcels. I implore you to consider letting individual homeowners with cell phone coverage issues take care of the matters individually. Having the blight of cell towers in my area, lowering my property values, jeopardizing my health is not what I moved 3,000 miles from California to Scarborough for. And most of all, I am discouraged because even though the townspeople you represent have repeatedly beseeched you to keep cell towers in industrial zones only and to not change zoning and to not give away our power to cell phone companies, it appears these pleas are falling on deaf ears. We have not been silent, but it's up to you to hear us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Laura Hannon of 17 Powderhorn Drive, and I'd like to thank you all for your continued work and consideration in this matter. Um, I do believe, I mean, I'm hoping that you will consider leaving towers in the industrial areas. Industrial areas will always be that, and their purpose is to provide jobs, goods, and services for members of the community. Cell towers do provide a service, so that's the appropriate and proper place for them. Um, please don't put them in residential or RF areas, even with a 25-acre minimum. This is a very important decision that will affect. Sorry, <laughs> this is a very important decision that will affect the landscape of Scarborough for decades to come. There's no going back once you open the door <coughs> to the cell companies. Changing the zoning gives power to the cell companies. These land parcels may have unforeseen uses at this time. They are areas which could someday become a neighborhood with another school or a community center, senior housing, or an athletic field. Or even think about the land down there by the Sar Scarborough Sackle line. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, you were just thinking it's a parcel of land, and now maybe it's going to become a, a National Guard readiness center. You know, and what would it be like if there was a big cell tower right in the middle of that land or any other land that may someday become something else? Um, uh, let's see. By opening the door to allow cell towers to be built on this land, you are limiting the options of how this land can be used decades from now. These towers should be looked at on an individual basis. Let the cell company suggest where they want to put it and then have a vote that the people in the neighborhood decide because they're the ones that have to live with it 24-7. Um, also, it seems to me that west of the turnpike is where most of the problems are, so maybe you could consider some different scenario over there. I think east of the turnpike, it seems like there's a lot of residents that are against it, and maybe just keeping it in the industrial zones um, on the east side of the turnpike would be a good choice. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, uh, Julius Sombranowitz, uh, 16 Minute Man Drive in Scarborough, and uh, just want to make a few points tonight. I, I know we chatted a bit about this beforehand at prior meetings. Um, thank you for your time on the issue. I, along with many others, am very grateful for your work on this. So uh, a genuine thank you very much. Uh, I, I will add a side note. I thought that uh, contract zoning discussion and that process uh, was pretty cool earlier. I wasn't entirely familiar with the contract zoning process. And uh, I'm not here to discuss how that might apply to the cell towers, but I thought it was interesting that there might be some use for it in that, that process. So uh, not something to discuss tonight, but I just was kind of thinking about that tonight as we were going through that discussion. I share your frustrations with the cell companies. Um, 
If they want a new cell tower, they need to tell the town exactly where they want it, period. Then we, the council and the town residents, can get together on a case-by-case -case basis and decide where we want it, too. Changing zoning without knowing exactly where the cell towers are being located would be, would be bad town planning, and I know it's driving you guys nuts right now. First, the residents here have made it clear that they oppose it. Second, if zoning changes go through, neither the residents or the council will be able to control where future cell towers are built. <coughs> Third, an arbitrary 25-acre lot size requirement still doesn't really fix the problem, since there would always be the unknown, meaning we will never know which 25-acre lot in town will be the next one to have a cell tower. Fourth, if you change the zoning, there is an FCC law that a town can't discriminate against cell providers. So if Scarborough changes its zone, it will be illegal for the town to tell one provider that it can build a, a, a cell tower in that zone and another that it can't. In Cape Elizabeth, that's exactly what happened. The cell companies would not have been able to sue the town if the proposed tower wasn't in an allowable use already, an allowable use in that zone already. This begs the question, why would a town as educated as Scarborough allow the cell companies to decide where towers will go and where they won't go in our town? The residents and the council appear to want cell towers in West Scarborough, so we should pick a couple locations in West Scarborough and put them there. The residents and the council appear okay with taller co-location towers in industrial zones, mm. so we should pick a location in an industrial zone and put a new cell tower there. But if you change the zoning, you won't be listening to the residents, and I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. My name is Ted Bennett from 3110 Lane. I had absolutely no ambitions whatsoever to say anything, but you guys look so serious like you're at a funeral, and, <laughs> and <laughs> we're in the same town. We're in the same boat here together. We appreciate what you're doing. I know it doesn't seem like it all the time, but thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate what Julius just said, um, and I would echo that sentiment. And uh, I also made the connection that there might be a potential benefit to this National Guard facility on the west end of Scarborough, um, putting a cell phone tower there. No idea what that would look like, because I know that's not our purpose tonight, but um, just one citizen's voice very much against the rezoning issue. And Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, Ron Bono, 6 Old Neck Road. Um, it was kind of interesting tonight, as painful as it was sitting through that long presentation, and I certainly admire you folks for being able to take that in. I couldn't do it. Uh, but I noticed a recurring theme. That recurring theme is pushback from citizens, from citizens when zoning is, is about to be changed or is being considered for changes. For example, the earlier case tonight, contract zoning out of the clear blue, uh, you know, with the cell towers, looking to put them in residential neighborhoods or, or rural farm areas, it, it, it's inevitable that you're gonna have citizen pushback when the comprehensive zoning that people use to determine where they live, how they live, whether they want to walk to a, walk to a Walmart or a Target and be right next door and are willing to put up with the traffic and the noise. These are all decisions we make when we invest in properties or invest in buying a home in Scarborough. And when you look at comprehensive zoning and then you see that being just turned around and 150 foot towers being considered and uh, located in residential neighborhoods, on town property in residential neighborhoods, it's, it's just inevitable that you have the pushback that we've seen tonight from that poor gentleman that lives near this project. I have nothing against UNE or whatever. I think they're all you know, worthwhile projects, but maybe not in these locations. The town has plenty of zoning areas that allow for UNE and allow for the, uh, the National Guard. They have plenty of zones that allow for um, towers, industrial zones. That's the way it's been. There's got to be some sense of stability, and I know there's a sensitivity to property values as well, that we're all concerned about our property values. We don't invest money in our homes and make it a place of, 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 of retreat for us and a place of investment, and then all of a sudden be faced with 
changes to zoning that was really not part of the not part of the game when when a decision was made to buy in a given location or to build a home in a given location. So I just ask that you keep that in mind when you make your final decision. I'd also just propose that if this does go further in terms of an additional of some comment about more information and other meetings and so forth, mm -hmm. there may be some people that are clearly opposed to uh, the uh, change in the ordinance be uh, placed on this ordinance committee. It's maybe a little late in the game, but their input is invaluable. We heard some great information this evening from, from some folks speaking this evening, and it would be nice to have their feelings represented. Uh, I've been at several of these meetings now, a couple I wasn't able to make because I was moving into a new home in Scarborough that I just built, but the, the reality is is that I've heard one person take the time to come to these meetings and speak for having these towers in residential zones. One person. And to me, it, it seems that the, the person that should be listened to the most are citizens of Scarborough, abutters in Scarborough, and not necessarily the businesses that want to come in and raise these towers in, the, in these different areas. I think, you know, that we, we there has to be some uh, priority given to citizens of Scarborough and people that would be impacted uh, by these changes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, with that I close the public hearing part and uh, had the public go first, so just in case there was any, um, any questions that needed to technically be answered by um, Dan. Yeah, so with that, I'm going to have Dan do his uh, overview of the amendments that uh, we're looking at. Um, nothing's final yet. Like I said earlier tonight, I uh, expect a uh, motion to table from the councilor um, because we're not there yet. So with that, I guess it's more of an update of where we are at with the cell phone tower issue. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As as the council attended, the planning board attended, and uh, members of the public, there was the workshop two weeks ago uh, to review some additional ideas for uh, amendments to the wireless proposal to to add additional tools and restrictions um, to create a, a higher bar for where towers could go in the community um, to to hopefully get to a point where they're screened and on on properties and uh, designed in a way that is as least impactful as possible. Um, as we talked about in that workshop, one of the things that's been considered is the whole hierarchy of a review process where the last um, choice, the least desirable choice would be to locate a tower at all in, the, in a rural or residential district. So start with existing towers, make um, applicants or providers see if they can add on existing towers. And, and not be able to propose um, anything if, if that is the case, anything new, and then look at the industrial districts which have been preferred by the council and the public and, and see if uh, new towers, the industrial zones, can, can serve uh, some of the poorly served areas in terms of coverage given the, the appropriateness of that zoning. Uh, to then look at uh, stealth installations within or on buildings so that they're not visible um, at all and, and don't have impacts um, from a view perspective or property value perspective. And then as the last, uh, um, the last opportunity or the last option, uh, look at rural and residential districts. So we're still looking at how that can look in terms of an ordinance amendments and, and reviewing it with uh, the town attorney. We also talked about streamlining the review in industrial districts, making it easy to install in industrial districts, have minimal setbacks, have minimal standards uh, as compared to very high standards for the rural district or residential districts. Uh, it's brought up, the 25 acre notion was brought up um, and that is uh, a significant uh, acreage threshold. There's no other use in town that requires that type of land area. Um, so looking at that and how that could um, could really screen towers from view of any surrounding abutters and giving the planning board the tools to um, 
require applicants to to show view corridors, show perspectives of where a tower would be on a large property and, and see if there's any viewer impacts at all. If they may not be visible at all from uh, the surrounding land area. So looking at standards that can give the planning board that level of um, scrutiny. And, and um, so that's kind of where we're at. We're still working on um, the proposed amendments and consulting with the town attorney and also the, the consultant that has been uh, advising the town um, on this initiative. And the consultant's also looking at some of the questions that came out of the workshop, uh, the notion of sort of the distributed antenna systems, and citing um, smaller antennas on utility poles in areas that was brought up by, I think, a few planning board members mm -hmm. to see if that's an option in parts of town um, that aren't really noticeable, noticeable at all, and that could avoid the need for new towers in certain areas. Um, it's my understanding that those work well in much denser areas, like maybe the beach communities. Um, they don't work so well in kind of the rural parts of the community, given the amount of infrastructure needed to serve um, a pretty low density environment. But we'll continue to look at that. And the consultant also is, continues to look at the idea of taller towers going above 130 feet, 150 feet um, in industrial districts or selected areas and understanding how much more the town can be served by that technology. Um, he's done some preliminary analysis on that um, and so he's going to continue to do that and provide some guidance to the, to the council on you know, what, how that expands coverage in the community and, and, and how far that can, can get the community in terms of improved coverage. Um, so we're really in a position to, by next Wednesday, have um, a completed draft of amendments to share with the council, to share with the public, to look at, and we also expect those answers to questions raised at the workshop to come from our consultant by next Wednesday. Um, towards the end of the day, so the intent is to um, complete that and make that available for your review and, and public review, and the council consider can consider whether this is you know on your next agenda for further discussion and, and consideration uh, on October 1st. And thinking that you might want to do that, we we do intend to have the consultant present at that meeting because he's an expert on the subject matter, um, and there's. At the workshop, a lot of technical questions came up that, uh, that Tom and I don't have the background to answer. So we wanted him to be here um, to, to respond to comments of the public and, 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 and the council and also maybe brainstorm on, you know, are there some standards that uh, we haven't looked at that, that could be helpful. So. Okay, with that, I have a motion. I move to table. Oh, no, nope, I want to. We're going to have council discussion. Well, that's why. Okay, for the purpose of discussion. <laughs> Move approval. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, questions uh, for Dan? I have one right off the bat. Um, now, the ordinance says uh, mandates co location. Um, if the tower is. Um, towers erected um, on a site um, and we have a ordinance saying co mandates co-location um, would a would this would the law allow another uh, cell phone company to find another 25 acre parcel to put up their antenna on um, the way the the intent for how the, the regulations would be written is to require before an additional tower can go up um, within the community, there's an existing tower that has room for co-location that if it is within the same service area, with the mm -hmm. same geographic area where they could provide the needed coverage improvements, um, they would need to locate their antennas on that existing tower. And they would have to prove to the planning board that that isn't the case before they can consider installing a new tower uh, within proximity to an existing one. So, okay, that was one of the questions tonight. Somebody asked, so I figured that. 
get that answered. So, um, oh, and just to answer uh, another uh, um, citizen asked tonight about um, putting citizens on the ordinance committee. The ordinance committee is made up of councillors. And at those ordinance committee meetings, input from the public is taken most of the time. Um, we had many, many times at the when the ordinance committee was uh, debating um, the cell phone tower issue. We di we did have uh, people come in and speak um, to that issue, and it was in the papers. So, and we had meeting after meeting after meeting for a year on it. So, and we're still working on it. So we're doing a, we're trying to do the best we can to um, try to satisfy folks. So with that, um, anyone have any other comments? Okay. I move to table. <coughs> Sorry, it's getting late. I'm losing it. Mm. Um, <laughs> I moved the table to such a time that the ordinance committee has conducted their review of any proposed changes and then to come back to council. Okay. Um, I didn't think it was going to go back before second. the ordinance committee. Mm -hmm. But now we get a second, so. It's all right. Um, Okay, we have a, a motion on the floor to table. There's no discussion. Can we just ask the clarification that yes. it, the motion was for it to go to, to them and not come back until they've... I'm just trying to get a sense if there's a date certain it comes back to the council. No, that was my it point. Doesn't. I was trying to allow for... Right. I, I thought... Okay. Okay. No, that's Can fine. I have a point of clarification? Sorry. Was not the purpose of the previous table to allow for ordinance to review, and that review has not happened? It, I, I'm not aware. I don't recall, frankly, whether ordinance, I don't think they need to be involved. Uh, they can certainly choose to be involved if they wish going forward. Leave that open then. It, it, I can answer. It was tabled originally to work on the amendments that we were brought forth during the um, the workshop. So, um, and Dan um, and staff and the council uh, needed that time to try to um, come up with the, the amendments, the wording, and the package that will be coming forward. That's why it's not ready for this evening. Right. Is that we need more input from the town, the attorneys, the, the attorney and the consultant on the language. Right. Also waiting for some answers from the cell companies. Yeah, right. But primarily, that's what we we're waiting for. That's another piece of it. They have to tell us why they can't just go up high. Right. I'm going to leave that as it stands. As it stands, stands okay, because back to the ordinance committee. All right, and um, the next ordinance committee is what the 15th of October. Yes. October 15th. Uh -huh. Nobody's screaming to get a new tower, so. Yeah, fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, right. Fine. Um, that works. Okay. And this is the second this meeting in October? Yeah. Right. It was, unfortunately, the chair of the ordinance committee was unable to attend tonight because she's very sick. So um, I would, would look for some input from her, but um, <coughs> as far as whether. The, the, she thought it needed to go back for the ordinance committee. However, since the motion's been made um, to table and refer back the ordinance, um, that's what we'll do. Well, that's the motion. That's the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Because the ordinance committee date isn't, I mean, it can be moved to okay. accommodate yeah. the, the town council's schedule. If, if this council um, decide <coughs> that they don't want it, you know, the rest of the council decides that um, you don't want to table it and refer it to the ordinance committee, then that should be a no vote 
to send back the ordinance committee, then I'd entertain another motion the other way, as far as just the plain table <coughs> and the date to uh, come back to the council. Correct? I, I would just simply observe that this, uh, the ordinance committee, committee could certainly be involved. The council has really acted as a committee of the whole over the right. last couple of months. Um, it's not inappropriate, certainly, to send it back to a committee for further work. But um, there is value, at least in my opinion, of having this discussion and conversation, public input in the council forum. It's uh, typically in the evenings with the luxury of television and, and the like. So in this forum, if we wanted it that way, we'd vote no on this motion uh, uh, to table and do a new motion to table. Correct. Okay. It's okay. Now, this motion was non-debatable, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a point, point of order. Yep. Point of order taken. Um, all those in favor? Um, in favor. <coughs> Opposed? Yeah, Do so, uh, hey, back to the main motion. Um, Hey, I, I thought the point was to hash it out in ordinance and let them. So I, I'll leave it all to <laughs> whatever, uh, whatever you guys are thinking. Can I ask a question as to uh, go back to the main motion discussion? Right. That uh, a motion to table does it need to date, uh, express a date certain? Or an event that you cannot, you cannot, you, you, you cannot, you can't, it doesn't matter. Okay. My understanding is a tabling motion needs to have a date certain or a process certain that's understood by all those. Oh, that's true, yes. Um, right. Give it a date. Uh, <coughs> right, I'm sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, a motion to table uh, until the uh, October 1st meeting. Mm. October. Is it well, before we make October, our October 1st and 15th. 15th. October 15th. Okay. Second. You're making that as a motion, right? Yes. Okay, your motion was the table till the October 15th, October 15th meeting. Town Council. Oh. Second. Okay. okay. Motion second. All those in favor? Opposed? Is that? All right. Under old, uh, a new business, sorry. Uh -huh. Order number 1484 is back on the request for a mass gathering permit from Stuart Paul to hold the insane inflatable 5K on Saturday, September 20, 2014, at Scarborough Downs, located on the Payne Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you have, do you want to go? Okay. Uh, Chief Thurlow, would you like okay. to speak on this issue? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. The application, uh, I sent you a memo, uh, the application was received um, after the deadline. Uh, staff has worked diligently with the applicant uh, because we are a business partner community and we've tried to do our best to work with them. Uh, the applicant has been very forthcoming in terms of our uh, local ordinance and I do believe that they are going to be able to meet all the requirements contained therein. So staff is recommending approval at this time. The event is this coming Saturday the 20th. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay, uh, discussion. Questions? Chief, have yes. you had enough time to go over this to your satisfaction so that uh, the process is not being shortchanged? The process isn't being shortchanged, and staff has been able to work with the applicant, and we're confident that. Uh, our reference checks have, have worked out well. We've had good reports from other communities where they've held these events. Um, it, it has been a little bit of an onerous process just because of the tight time frame uh, mm -hmm. and the detail involved in these types of processes, but I am confident that uh, they have met the burden of the ordinance. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Caterina. Do we know why they weren't able to meet uh, their like requirements of their license and uh, why no one from that organization is here tonight? There is a oh, okay. <laughs> mm, is there a good reason for it? Hi, I'm Anna Kuhn, Town Square Media. 
Um, I do apologize, and, and they have been so wonderful in getting us these permits. We are a nationwide company, and I am the local event planner, but this is a nationwide event. So it is down from the corporate level, and they were just unfamiliar with the permitting here in Maine. They didn't realize that, you know, all of the processes that had to go through. Um, so they were a little late in submitting that if they had not had to go through this in different states before. So I apologize for that. It was not intentional. Um, they were just unaware, and there was a, a lack of communication between me at the local level and them at the corporate. I would have been happy to help and, and have been working with you guys to get that done because I am here local and understand more of the laws, which is why I've kind of been able to push it forward. But I apologize for the delay in the process. Yeah, because... I mean, one of my concerns is that, you know, you have a rule for a reason and, sure. <clears throat> and it wasn't met, and to me, ignorance of the law isn't a good excuse, but I just thought I'd throw that out there just because <laughs> I, I hate to see, you know, other um, groups thinking they can come in at the last minute and get mass gathering. And the sure. thing for me with the mass gathering is um, how many people are you expecting or cars, traffic? Uh, it's, we're parking at Cabela's and shuttling them into Scarborough Downs. So but how many cars are you expecting to come it's into Scarborough? 3,000 total participants, so um, that w there won't be 3,000 cars. We're probably doing about under 1,000. Okay. And they're all coming in at different times because there are waves for the race, so they're not all coming in at once. Because yeah. so I, I don't live very far from there. Yeah. So it's kind of like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was sort of... <laughs> I mean, the Beach Ridge Motor Speedway is there when they have big events there it's the same amount of traffic in and out. So it wouldn't have any other bigger impact than it would for a normal Beach Ridge Motor Speedway or a big Scarborough Downs event. Except it was, it's not on a the regular, we know Beach right. Ridge runs every Thursday. Right. Friday, it's Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But right. it starts um, at 8 a.m. and it will be over by 3 p.m. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was my only, co I just wanted to voice that concern. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Okay. What is um, insane inflatable 5K? What are you doing? <laughs> and why? Um, the best way to describe it is the, the it's a, over a 5K, so it's like any other road risk they have. So, for example, a Tough Mudder has these obstacles built with mud and wire and you know wood. Instead of those type of obstacles, we just have big 120 foot inflatable, basically. So, I guess the best way to describe it has you ever seen that show Wipeout? Mm -hmm. So it's not as intense, and we don't intentionally hurt people and make them look foolish, but it's like a giant bounce house for an adult, basically. And we've had 50 of these throughout the, throughout the country that have been successful in every other market. So it's not a new event. We have a whole team that comes in and runs the whole thing. And is this a, some kind of a fundraising event for yep. something? Or? It goes to, uh, closely to the benefits go to Camp Sunshine. They're our charity for the event. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I guess I'll just add my two cents, although um, I don't like the warm and fuzzy. I agree with Jim Marie that, you know, ignorance isn't necessarily an excuse, but I'm willing to bend a little bit, especially where, you know, the, the chief is happy, he feels that he's had adequate time to address it, and um, it is, after all, a charity event. Mm -hmm. um, if maybe perhaps this was a concert or something else, I wouldn't feel quite that way, but, um, you know, I'll support it. Good to know. Might be fun to watch. <laughs> she definitely can. It's free to watch. It's been on Facebook. They're on Facebook. Anything yeah. down this end? <laughs> Questions? Comments? All set. All set. You're all set? Mm -hmm. You're all set? Ah, you just got to set. Anybody else? Second round? No? Okay, I'll speak now. Um, I absolutely came here tonight. Um, definitely going to vote no on, um, on this... Um, request for mass gathering permit. But after hearing Chief Thurlow and staff put so much time into this already, town, time and money, um, and uh, I guess I'll uh, have to change my mind on my vote, but I, I hope this doesn't happen anymore because we have rules and everyone here is, is well, quiet down this end, but <laughs> have all spoke of, you know, we have rules in place for a reason, and uh, this can't be the norm. So, uh, like I said, um, that's also going out to staff. We're not going to work, you know, put our all our resources in um, 
if people are going to come in with late applications. We need the time uh, to process these applications and make sure that um, everything's done right and the T's across. So, with that, I see no one else. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. I sure it won't happen again. Thank you. Okay, uh, non action items. Okay, there are none. Standing and special committees, I'll start with Council of Ways. Um, I haven't been to any uh, committee meetings the last couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Council of Benedict. No. Okay. Council of Holbrook. Um, the quicker version is finance met early this week. Um, we had um, a very good dialogue and, and session with the school board. Um, there's some interesting things um, that we're hoping to work forward and through coming into the next budget year as far as timing and planning and, and how to make meetings work. Um, his, historic Preservation um, has scheduled a, um, a, a property owner's meeting. Um, this is going to be on the 24th. First at, I think it was set for 6 p.m., 6.30. And um, the purpose of that meeting is to kind of touch base with some of the interested and um, vested owners to reach out to them a little bit of historic properties mm -hmm. and um, just kind of talk with them a little bit. The first one, um, goal being to just let them know maybe, you know, that they're aware that they have something that's special and unique. The second goal and priority for the meeting is to um, engage the owners in some conversation about what would be beneficial to them to help them preserve it um, and, and some ideas and concepts from them. Um, I did also just want to make a note that um, Dan, as well as um, some, some public works members, went down to the Danish Village site today um, and to look at the archway. We did have a meeting with um, the new owners, which is the hospice. Um, so we did get permission as a town to, to go on site, look at the archway, look at the fountain, um, and they're going to be, um, like I said, did look today, they're going back with a mason to kind of gauge the integrity um, and the potential for maybe moving it off-site, maybe mm. in the park or, you know, Hunter House, we're still kind of working some of the, you know, where it would be best and if it is movable. So, <coughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Um, and, and feasibility as far as financially, how, how that might, might line up. Mm. So, um, and I know there's more, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, for, sweet. Yeah. Save it for a next time. Councilor Donovan. Uh, I uh, joined Councilor Holbrook at the uh, Finance Committee meeting this week. Uh, it was, I thought, a very uh, beneficial communication and exchange with the members <coughs> of the school department. I think we are benefiting from this greater uh, communication with the school department. Uh, I personally learned some things that I think were important to know as a member of the Finance Committee uh, and will uh, assist us in our discussions next year, which uh, will be, uh, will be uh, uh, very much in pursuit of information to do a good job for the town on the budget. Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Yeah, I have to look at my Conservation Commission <coughs> meeting minutes here. Because we talked about a few things. We did uh, worked on our annual report and turned that in. Um, we discussed potential activities. Um, they wanted to make sure that we're reviewing projects that come up before the council, as I mentioned to, tonight. You know, mm -hmm. a couple of things we should be looking at. Um, there was uh, something brought up by one of the members of undertaking a survey of properties that are adjacent to town-owned conservation lands in order to better understand what possibilities might exist for future conservation activity. Um, bear with me here. Um, oh, a review of all the conservation easements currently in town, if it made sense, and it was fairly easy to do that, to see where they are and see if they're being maintained. Mm -hmm way they said they would maintain them, and let's see. And a workshop during the winter with the Scarborough Garden Club 
regarding uh, native landscaping. And that's it. We had, we had a pretty fruitful discussion. I said it was pretty far-reaching. So, And then my other one is long-range planning. Um, and we talked about concepts for Dunstan, uh, began that process. Um, and um, we're still debating where our next meeting is. I'm looking at Dan. Because another project we're going to be looking at, wrong, long, I can't even talk anymore. Long range planning is uh, zoning for the beach areas. You know, should we be doing special, you know, a new type of zone for Higgins and Fine Point in particular? So that's it for me. Okay. Um, I'll just report Council of St. Clair was unable to um, be here tonight, so I'll just reporting on the Ordinance Committee. The Ordinance Committee was canceled. Uh, it still had some um, more um, additional information that we haven't received yet, so nothing to do with staff. But um, so we uh, so it was canceled and um, be taken up at a later date on the what was it the 17th. 15th. 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 Yep. 15th. Okay, 15th. Uh, that's all I have to report. Uh, with that, town manager's report. I have nothing earth shattering to report. I mean, I, I could, but I would yield my time to council comments. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing to report on the lovely vacation you took. Vacation. It was professional development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the only comment I'll make. I <laughs> thank you for supporting me. I attended the 100th anniversary. I don't think it's the 100th anniversary of the conference, but my professional association, the International City Managers Group, is 100 years old, and it's a uh, it's uh, a wild time. 4,000 of us uh, <laughs> uh, get together, predominantly North American, but there's the international uh, component as well. Uh, this year was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was on a plane at five o'clock this morning. So I'm uh, I'm I'm dragging a bit, and <laughs> I'll make sure to report uh, at the next meeting. Okay. With that, uh, Councilor comments, and we'll go to Councilor Holbrook. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> How are you, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Councilor Donovan. Uh, I will say that they, uh, and I'm really echoing comments of others, uh, the comment about the town council, the town government uh, acting in a secret manner was really off base. Uh, and, and I've got to compliment Councillor uh, Katerina because she has been pushing for greater communication. And I've got to compliment the chair because the chair has picked up on some of these things and we're doing more uh, of these workshops. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think they're great because I think it gives us a chance to really just have a, an exchange with people on important issues. So uh, I was pretty pleased. But then on a, a lighter note, uh, I was told by one of the beach monitors who was on the beach today at Higgins uh, counting uh, migratory birds that they saw a piping plover. Oh my there. gosh. So they're still on our beaches. So uh, I think they, uh, they obviously enjoy uh, Scarborough's beaches. Thank you. Councilor Katerina. Um, I was going to talk to communication, but thank you, Councilor Donovan. But we are working, and I think that, mm -hmm. it, and it's a conundrum, and I know people get frustrated, but people also, it, it's, it's just human nature, and unless something hits you between the eyes, you could have it posted all over the world. You're not going to pay any attention to it. So, anyway, thank my you. two cents worth. Councilor Blaze. Uh, I'd just like to say that I, I found the discussion on the contract zones extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think it's probably new to most of us, mm -hmm. contract zones. And I know that uh, it's raised a lot of questions in my mind, that uh, uh, especially the Piper Shores contract zone mm. is going to be answered before... I feel that I can make any decision on that. Piper Shores is an absolutely wonderful oh, yeah. uh, place and a, a tremendous addition to our town. And I personally feel that it, it should continue to expand, but I also understand that the conservation issue is a big one, but I think there's a lot of background in that conservation issue that's got to come out onto the table before we can really make a decision on it. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I got to say. 
Thank you. Councillor Benedict. I have nothing to add. Okay, with that, um, I get to say, Councillor Holbrook, <laughs> suggestion of um, if the uh, if the uh, National Guard is successful down there with the artifacts of the Civil War oh, right. guns. Cro oh, that that's a, was a wonderful idea, but I was kind of hoping he says, yeah, we've got a uh, World War II tank. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or or Ooh, something. Um, to put out front on the front lawn of the place like they do at a lot of places. But anyhow, with that being said, um, the comments made tonight a uh, little bit disturbing and off, as Councillor uh, Donovan said. Um, you know, I heard it drummed up again, the land swap down the Pine Point. Uh, just for the public that doesn't know, um, we had many public meetings about the, the land swap deal, and we had outreach at the fire station down to Engine 4. I attended three of them. So to say that there was no public um, input or comments is absolutely false. And, uh, it, you know, uh, it, and we hear this time to time, folks getting up to the podium, um, kind of misrepresenting some things. So um, with that being said, um, adjournment. So moved. Take a second. All those in favor. Hey. Good night. <coughs> oh, my God. We're trying to be ready for bed now.